Okay, so now we start with the conference. Uh, welcome to all uh, speakers. Uh, welcome to all uh, uh, participants to the, this uh, sixth uh, Euro Symposium on Healthy Aging. Maybe the seventh will be a symposium on healthy longevity because it's a better word. We will have, uh, I think and I hope, uh, 10 hours of uh, great uh, talks during uh, two days, the first day five hours and the second day five hours as well. At the end of these uh, two days, we will present uh, uh, you a text uh, based on the Brussels Declaration for Radical Health Span Extension that we were, uh, that, that was adopted uh, four years ago before the COVID times uh, on the, let's say, not very positive side, uh, but also before uh, last uh, progress concerning longevity. So these two days uh, will be recorded. I want already to thank uh, uh, Ilya, to thank uh, Shivani, to thank uh, Malvina uh, for being uh, uh, really uh, uh, there for the preparation. Uh, without them, it would not be, they, they would not, we would not have this uh, conference. And now a few uh, technical points. So first, uh, um, please uh, mute yourself uh, if you do not speak. Please also, um, it's better to stop the camera, but it's not, not compulsory, but it's better for uh, uh, the, the flow, I would say. And uh, uh, when uh, you are uh, speaking, uh, please unmute yourself. Uh, please uh, use the camera, except if you are uh, very shy. And uh, for, the, um, for the speakers, normally uh, you will be able to share the screen like classical for the Zoom. For the uh, other, for the, for the participants, uh, you will be able to ask uh, questions uh, in the chat and they will be after each talk time for one or two questions, and then there will be two question uh, and answer times uh, at the end of the, uh, the two sessions. Uh, one, uh, the, the first session will be shared by Ilya Stambler. The second session today will be chaired by me. Um, before that each uh, speaker is uh, beginning, uh, we will have a very, very short introduction and they will be in the chat, the bio of the, uh, of the speakers. Okay, so now we will really uh, begin uh, this conference. Please uh, um, don't forget that the ultimate goal, I think for all of us, is how to progress uh, for healthy longevity for all those who want it. So questions related to this. Thank you. And uh, the floor is to the chair, Ilya. Thank you. Thank you very much, Didier. Uh, thanks for driving this effort. Uh, thanks uh, through all those years. Uh, the sixth one, an amazing initiative and proud to, to open the first session. Uh, uh, the first speaker will be Lada Nuzna, who is currently the director, the project director at the Impetus Foundation, and uh, she will talk about changing the timelines for life extension research. Uh, you can start sharing your screen. And just for all the speakers, uh, each will have twenty minutes, including including questions. Uh, we have a very intense program, so please keep to the schedule. Um, thank you. So, uh, Lada, the floor is yours, please. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, as Ilya already mentioned, I run Impetus Grants. I also do research in aging biology and molecular tool development. Um, in Impetus, we fund non-conventional aging research, which you might or might not know about, but I want to start this presentation with a question. Um, how many successful aging clinical trials do you expect to happen by the time you are 80 or 90? If you see, do a simple back of the envelope calculation, and I estimate very simplistically here, we get a few big health span 
trials per year. If you measure your Romanian life in the number of trials we can run during those years, we get a few hundred trials or way less total until aging becomes a big concern on a personal level. Now, how many of those clinical trials are actually going to be successful? Given the success rate of clinical studies, the number of hits in those trials will be low or close to zero. I admit that the question on the slide might be somewhat radically phrased and doesn't take into account the fact that sometimes good things happen by chance. I mean, no one could have predicted CRISPR and it completely changed the research landscape as it looks right now and the types of things we can do. But I would argue that we do not want to rely on luck too much. It might or might not come. This brings me to the question of the rate at which great aging research comes into life. If you think about it, there are two variables we can tweak here for improving the outcomes. One of them is hit rate, so the quality of research. And the second one is the rate at which we get research done and published, the rate at which we start new clinical trials. So this is the old good uh, quality quantity dichotomy. Now, quality of research is not entirely a black box, but serendipity plays a huge role in it. As such, quality of research is much harder to control systematically. The rate at which research occurs is an entirely observable variable though. And while the research process or clinical trials cannot simply be accelerated because they take time to output a result, we can still often accelerate the boring parts, the bureaucracy, the grant writing, the year long back and forth to publish papers and other things. Um, that's exactly what we did at Impetus. It sort of started with uh, as a reaction to two things. Uh, one of them is that traditional funding is under exploring directions of aging biology and became too conservative too early on, which is always risky with new fields. In a way, it's almost paradoxical. The biggest risk in this case is not to take enough risks with types of things you fund. Um, the second observation is that um, was how slow funding is. Traditional funding cycle is about a year, which holds back many researchers from starting their work. We started a year ago, so you'd expect there isn't much to share of our results for now, but one can get a lot done when there is a radical simplification of the process. So all in all, in one year, we funded 114 projects with breakdown of some directions on this slide. I have seen around seven papers published in this year with three being an outlier good science in my humble opinion. Um, I think a year ago, I wouldn't be ready to say that impetus is 100% a good idea. I mentioned it several times in other presentations too. At the start, we don't really know whether impetus did since right or not. We were cutting 50 page proposals down to two pages, making decisions after only like 15, 20 minutes of total review time per application, removing all the preliminary data and making a lot of risky bets in agent science. And there is no track record that this can be a good idea. And yet now seeing the first work come out, I'm becoming more and more convinced that it was indeed a much needed program. As such, throughout my work, I think a lot about how we can change timelines of current agent research, not as I already mentioned, not all parts of research can be accelerated. Um, you cannot accelerate the normal cycle of trial and error or clinical studies, but bureaucracy is not a clinical trial. We can and should minimize it or ideally remove it from funding process completely. Um, Impetus tried to be an agent of change here, but after a year of running a program, um, I started coming to the conclusion that the change in timelines and efficiency cannot just come from a few private donors who decided to do things more efficiently. I mean, $25 million budget is a lot, but that's absolutely nothing compared to billions of dollars at which governmental organizations operate. So these quick fixes would just be patches on a system that doesn't globally work well. Uh, which leads me to present the work I've been doing more recently, um, a policy change within National Institute of Health and National Institute of Aging to enable its institutes to fund things faster. I really hope we can help figure out how not to hold scientists back by making them wait for funding for longer than a year, which is the current timeline. It's also somewhat amusing to me that the size of the grant has little to no correlation with uh, funding timelines. In other words, even proof of concept it just takes a year to fund. So many transformative ideas that exist in this area are historically underfunded with one famous example of Catalina Carico famously struggling to get her 
funding from NH for her breakthrough mRNA vaccine work. Intuitively, it seems that having longer grant applications and longer review process ensures that both researchers and reviewers alike commit a lot of effort in addressing all the pitfalls and failure modes uh, before research starts. While technically true, the citation doesn't consider the unpredictable nature of research. And additionally, history proves again and again that the quality of Endeavor is largely uncorrelated from longer planning timelines. I mean, of the recent examples, it took Moderna 45 days to develop scenes from the moment COVID genome was published. That's an absolutely like crazy timeline for anything. And uh, during World War II, National Defense Research Committee was funding since uh, within one week of grant application. And it led to things like proximity fuse, the radar, like Manhattan Project. Maybe we need more Manhattan projects of aging. Um, so it started, this work I'm presenting here, started as a policy memo draft and later found its own support with an advocacy group in DC that is now gathering for this, uh, gathering support for this at Congress. Um, officially, this memo will be published within the next two weeks, but I wanted to present its key suggestions today. Uh, one of them is development of an age directive to all of its 36 institutes, including National Institute of Aging, and more importantly for me, National Institute of Aging, to deploy programs with faster funding timelines. Um, the second one is creation of working group that can like make this authorization happen. And the last one is um, investigation into how government reacted to COVID pandemic, because government actually did have a record of funding since fast, but no one knows about it. Most scientists I talk to in the United States have no idea that there are any fast grants happening within the government, which is a mystery how they happen without anyone knowing. Um, but yeah, uh, I'll publish them soon so you can read more about that there. So why am I presenting this here? First, of course, I really believe that the more people a certain information will reach, the more likely it is that science will happen and serendipity, serendipity will be on our side. If you have ideas about how to get this more to more people within government, please, please do reach out. Um, I left my email on this last slide. Right now, I'm in touch with directors of different programs within National Institute of Aging, but ideally we can get more representatives from NIH to support this policy. Mm -hmm. Second, this policy memo concerns NIH. I decided to focus on NIH and not on global policy making because if it's specific um, to everyone, it's really specific to no one. Um, that being said, if you want to make it work in Europe or you know people who might be interested in doing it, please also contact me and I would love to brainstorm about this with you. As a final note, I wanted to mention that our progress happens not only in the labs and benches, but also on a more systematic level. In a way, I hope that more people will be involved in this type of advocacy in aging, because right now, neither Europe nor, nor the United States are ready for their first real longevity trial, let alone first real longevity drug. Now, it's my first time presenting this work anywhere at all. So far, I have been gathering opinions from policymakers, government, but ultimately the people uh, that will benefit the most from this work are real scientists. I think it would be fair if we used Q&A session for feedback, criticism, suggestions related to this idea. So please do let me know if you have any. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lada. Uh... Guys, uh, leave your questions in the chat uh, so um, uh, we can ask them now or during the uh, questions and answer sessions. Uh, so please, uh, for now, uh, do you have any questions? Uh, not yet. If not yet, then you know, um, uh, save your answers um, for for later. Uh, so questions for later. Oh, here's one. Is it sensible to assume that NH objectively wants to extend lifespan? Elders are expensive to the government, um, and our best angle is to defeat the tendency in healthy aging is cheaper than chronic disease. Uh, what is your take on that? Um, well, I don't know if institutions themselves hold an opinion. It's usually the leaders of institutions that can have strong opinion. Um, this policy memo itself doesn't um, assume any opinion, like any of those opinions um, and it's like targeted. That's why it's like targeted towards NH in general and doesn't use like controversial language because that's 
an easier way to make sure it will happen. Um, I also see that Aubrey asked uh, to what extent will this program need legislation. I think this program is legislation. This would this won't work unless um, we'll find support in Congress. So um, it is policy work. Yeah, so Lara, um, just to amplify the question, um, uh, because yeah, I mean, in principle, of course, uh, money could be taken from one place into another within the NIH without any new money. But uh, clearly, if there is new money, that would require legislation and that would be much better, uh, though there are possi the possibilities of executive orders. Um, uh, I was just thinking um, it would be very valuable if you were to work with the various people who are currently lobbying Congress in this area. I'm sure you know of A4LI, which we're funding, and um, also um, Schmidt Futures are doing some work in that area. So maybe we can talk about that later. Yeah, uh, we actually, so I started this from like an inspiration from Schmidt, Schmidt Futures, so that's a reasonable assumption. Um, I, I don't know if it's there, like, I'm trying to, like, when I was writing this policy memo, I was trying to, like, make it as easy for government as possible to make it happen. So I don't assume any new money coming to space. I just assume that, um, like, what we want to get is from NIH to enable its own institutes to, like, launch alternative programs. So not only the normal funding yearly cycle, but, like, okay, we want urgent grants now. Can we make them happen next month? Great, great. Uh, and by the way, thank you. Um, uh, if you don't want to write uh, your questions in the chat, you can actually raise uh, your hand as Aubrey did and uh, we'll address you. So any other questions? We still have time. Um, I don't know. Uh, uh, actually, uh, Daria asks if you can uh, send the presentation. Actually, we already have it recorded, but if you can. Yeah, I can send the presentation. Um, I don't know if this question is addressed to me, but someone asked if I know oh. about. Uh, yes, all the questions are for you for, for now. Okay. Um, so, uh, do you know something about AI simulations of clinical trials? And what do you think about simulating trials to speed up the research? I mean, <laughs> it's like all models are on. <laughs> so um, anyway, I, I spent um, a while doing deep learning research. I kind of transitioned out of it because statistics is like one of those tools that can really easily full one like genome-wide association studies like sometimes you can just like flip it in any way you want and like you want you can create a simulation such that it tells you the things you want to see um so it's very tricky maybe yeah in the future right now it all relies on data and i don't think we have the right type of data to do those things okay great other questions All right. If there are no other questions, then uh, we move to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Lada, again. Thank and you. Uh, thank you. And we go to our next speaker, who is Professor Lorna Harris, uh, who is a molecular geneticist at the University of Exeter College of Medicine and Health. And uh, she will um, uh, speak about oligonucleotide synotherapies for the diseases of aging. Um, is uh, Laura, uh, Lorna with us? Lorna, you here? I'm afraid she's not here. I didn't saw her name. Uh, uh, so maybe the next speaker directly, I will also send an email to us. Yes, okay, fine. So uh, if so, then the next speaker is uh, Professor Jean-Marc Lemaitre, uh, who, um, uh, who is uh, currently uh, in Instagram Research Director at the Institute for Regenerative Medicine and Biotherapy in Montpellier, IRMB in France. And uh, he will speak about the transient reprogramming early in life as a new paradigm to promote health and longevity. Uh, so Professor Lemaitre, please. So, sharing your screen. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for this, uh, this invitation and organization. Um, I will share my screen. Um, do you see something? Uh, not yet, no, please. Um, uh, you not have yet, to... okay, we'll start again. <laughs> it's always a problem. Um, boop, boop, boop. 
Yes, now it's getting, yes, just uh, okay, make it full screen. And that's it. Full screen. Yes. Fine. Yes. Now it's great. Fine. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, with my uh, with my research group, we are interested in for many years now uh, in uh, senescence and uh, reprogramming, and uh, oh, cannot switch. Ah, okay, I will switch with it. Um, yes. Uh, in, in fact, uh, in the last decade, uh, we observed in the field of aging a sort of paradigm sh shift and. We identify now probably for every, every laboratory, every researcher working on the field that aging could be considered as a disease. And if we, if we would like to, to improve the longevity, uh, an healthy longevity, probably we have to target aging uh, more than target age-related disease. And the reason is because we identified many different hallmarks of aging, of cellular aging. And, uh, and uh, with this hallmark, we can follow the, the aging process, but we can also target the aging process. And probably a major objective in the, in the field in the, next, uh, in the next year will be to integrate the knowledge of the, this new geroscience into uh, the, the geriatric medicine and to, to try to intervene uh, into uh, aging uh, in general. So my vision is that among these hallmarks, there is probably a major hallmark, uh, more uh, interesting to focus on. And we decided to focus on uh, two of these hallmarks a few years ago in my lab, based on the the, this vision of uh, the cells, uh, if we age, is because our cells age, and our cells are submitted to many different stress, intrinsic and extrinsic stress during their life, and they damage uh, all the time, and, and they have to repair, and they have to make choice. Uh, if they can repair, they, 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 they modify the, sometimes the epigenome associated and they, they keep all mark of aging, but they are still alive. They can uh, renew uh, tissue, they can replenish the tissue, proliferate, but they do their job uh, more probably more, more difficultly. And um, associated to this uh, epigenetic drift, and there is modification of the gene expression and, the, and also of the cell uh, the stem cell plasticity. So this is what I call aging as deprogramming. And uh, if the, the damage is, is too, too difficult to, to repair, uh, either the cell uh, go into apoptosis and it lead to depletion of, of, the, of the cell or stem cell, sometimes in tissue, uh, or she enter in this kind of uh, well-known now senescence, uh, really deleterious for, for the tissue when they accumulate in, in, in aging because they secrete many different factors uh, in the microenvironment and really de deleterious uh, to the tissue. So definitely these two marks are really a nice old mark to follow to evaluate aging uh, progression by the secretion uh, of the senescent cell, for example, the SASP. We can also find the SASP in, in the blood and, and, and follow aging and senescence. And also in many different tissue, this kind of epigenetic drift. And uh, clearly for me, this is uh, two uh, important key of aging uh, because they are found in many uh, different uh, age-related disease. And this is uh, this hallmark I decided to, to focus on. So uh, initially, when I started to work on aging, uh, we decided to, to ask the question, uh, is cell aging uh, reversible? It was a, a big question. And uh, at this time, we benefited of this uh, discovery of Professor Yamanaka, uh, who, who showed that uh, the cell identity is reversible and it showed that we can convert an adult cells into a pluripotent stem cell. So it means an undifferentiated cell, then able to 
to be differentiated or redifferentiated and into any kind of cell. So it, it opened the door to, to the cell therapy with eventually rejuvenated cells. And my question first was, uh, is it possible to reprogram uh, old cells and citizen cell with this uh, uh, reprogramming cocktail of uh, OCT4, SOX2, Nano, uh, um, Caleb4, and CIMIC? And we, we didn't success with, with this uh, reprogramming um, uh, on uh, age cell and, and senescent cell. And in the future, uh, it has been shown, and even by the, the laboratory of Yamanaka itself, then that senescence was a, a barrier to reprogramming and uh, aging was a break for this uh, reprogramming. So we decided to, to, to investigate time <laughs> to find a new strategy, an optimized strategy to be able to, to drive IPS, induced peripotent stem cell from this uh, age cell and senescent cell. And so we, come, we, we tried another cocktail, the cocktail of, of um, James Thompson, uh, replacing KLF4 and Seming, uh, potential oncogene. And uh, we didn't success uh, with this cocktail, but we successed with, this, with the combination of this uh, cocktail, the two cocktail, making the reprogramming process with six factor. And uh, with this uh, six factor, we were able to derive IPS uh, with uh, efficiently with uh, um, from senescent cells, but also from really old cells. It was a centenarian fibroblast, and uh, we were able to redifferentiate this IPS into fully rejuvenated cells. So we demonstrated at this time that cellular aging was re reversible. And uh, because it opened the door to, to, to cell therapy, uh, we spent time to develop disease modeling from age uh, for accelerated aging syndrome and also uh, for age-related disease. And even more, we are involved in a European project uh, to make a proof of concept of the possible usage of uh, this technology. Uh, to treat um, the degenerations of the, the inter intervertebral disc. And uh, we are building today a, a CGMP uh, IPS facility to, to go into the clinic in, in our institute. But still, uh, at the same time, uh, because as you know, uh, cell therapy depends on the differentiation process for each cell type, so it, it's really long. A uh, uh, long die, in fact, and uh, in the in parallel, we we decided to to try to ask the question: Is it possible to bypass this pluripotent uh, stem cell stage? And we we develop uh, in vitro and in vivo experiment uh, to 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 try to demonstrate this. First, we 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 develop. Uh, reprogramming model with a, a progeria um, uh, allele or, or without progeria allele. And we, we uh, try to, 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 to induce uh, this reprogramming transiently uh, in fibroblast uh, collected from this uh, mice model. And we induce uh, by doxycycline the expression on the cassette of uh, for, uh, bearing this uh, four uh, Yamanaka factor. And contrary to, to what was initially demonstrated, if we, we um, uh, uh, force the expression of the, the four uh, factors up to uh, IPS stage, uh, we show that uh, with this short reprogramming, uh, we were able to decrease DNA damage but also senescence, and we activate autophagy uh, associated to the short reprogramming. And, uh, but we didn't observe a, a shift in the metabolism as we observe if we convert the cells into IPS. So it means uh, Oxfox uh, metabolism to gl uh, glycolysis. It was not observed with this uh, short induction. But then we, we decided to go uh, uh, in, in, uh, in the, the global animal 
Uh, first, we show that uh, there is many different genes uh, differentially expressed by this short uh, induction of, uh, of these uh, reprogramming factors. But what was uh, not expected, it, it, because we started with fibroblast, we observed that by gene ontology analysis with these uh, differentially expressed genes, that for sure there was uh, one healing activated and, uh, and the response to wounding. Uh, but associated to these genes, we found also uh, some re regeneration process uh, triggered in many different uh, uh, organ, uh, in muscle, in kidney, in, 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 uh, in uh, even cardiac tissue. So it means that probably when we induce these uh, genes uh, by the, 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 the four factors, it could probably act on different kinds of tissue. This is what we decided to look at. And uh, initially, we tried to reproduce what was published before because uh, 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 Dr. Ocampo uh, uh, in the laboratory of, uh, of uh, Giuseppe Belmonte showed that uh, with the a similar model uh, of project model and, and reprogramming model, uh, but uh, with, uh, with homozygous progeria, so living. Uh, uh, half the time that heterozygote pro progeria. And they show that a chronic induction of reprogramming two days a week during all the life of the animal increased the longevity uh, of, the, of the animal around 30%. So we did the same experiment on, on the heterozygous progeria to reproduce the effect. And we, we observed that uh, uh, effectively we increased the longevity of this animal. And we, we try different type of regimen of induction. And uh, one uh, induction was to, uh, process was to decrease the level of induction, but to do it continuously during the life, not chronically. Uh, and, and what we observed, it, it's similar. So we increase also the, the, the longevity of uh, the animal of 30% approximately. And with this low induction, we asked the question whether one induction only was able to improve the longevity of the animal. So we started to, to, to induce uh, the gene expression of the reprogramming factor during 2.5 weeks and early in the life of the animal. So it means at two months. And we look at the longevity of the, the animal. So we observe really a, still modification, but non-significant. But if we increase the, the, the level of induction, we observe that there is an increase of the longevity in old age, in old age uh, of 15%, so really significant. And uh, we also did the same experiment on non-progeric mice. And we also observed, even if we induced uh, the, the, the reprogramming factor at two months, that later we observe an increased longevity, even in, in, in non-progenetic mice. So then we, we, we ask whether we improve the tissue uh, associated to this increased longevity. So we, we, we induce at two months and we look at eight months uh, the tissue. But what was really amazing for us is that immediately after the induction of reprogramming at two months, we observed an improvement of the, the body composition of the animal. And, and we, we maintained the, the lean mass uh, lifelong for them. And, and we also decreased uh, the, the, the fat mass uh, all, the, all the life of the animal. And associated to this uh, uh, body composition, there is an improvement of either the, 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 the the force the, the, by the grip test or uh, the, the more the, the, the agility and uh, uh, on the rotor test. And this is for all the life of the, of the animal. Then we, we decided to look at age-related disease like osteoarthritis. And, uh, and, and we, we observed that even if we do the treatment at two months, later, we have an improvement of the, 
of the cartilage, there is an increased uh, volume of the cartilage, uh, degradation of the surface, but also uh, on the subchondral region, we have also an increase uh, of the bone volume and the, and the bone sickness associated to, to, to this treatment early on, 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 the, on the life of the animal. And uh, even more, if we look at osteoporosis, uh, we have similar effects. So it means that we increase the bone volume on the tibia cortical region, and we also increase the mineral density associated with, to this. If we look at the, at the kidney, uh, with the age, we observe that uh, there is a, uh, uh, an increase in the fractional uh, mesangional array around the, the glomeruli. And, uh, uh, and we also increase the glomeruli, glomeruli with the age. And uh, with our treatment early on, on the life, we, we prevent this uh, enlargement of the mesangeal area and also the, the, the ultrastructure or micro uh, architecture of the, of the tissue. And if we look at the spleen, uh, again, we have an improvement. And uh, uh, with the age, there is uh, between the, the white pulp and the red pulp on the, on the, uh, on the, the spleen, uh, a marginal zone separating uh, these two parts of the, of, the, of the spleen. And there is a, a distortion with the age of this, uh, of this uh, marginal zone. And with the treatment early on, on uh, reprogramming treatment, we have an improvement and maintenance of this, uh, of this uh, uh, zone uh, uh, on the two compartments of the, of the spleen. Uh, because, uh, because aging is also associated to, to fibrosis, we decided to look at the fibrosis in different organs. We, we look at this on kidney, on spleen, and uh, as, uh, as you, can, you can see that there is a decrease in the fibrosis associated to, to this reprogramming early in the life of the animal. And uh, for liver and heart, there is a, a tend to, to, to decrease, but uh, not significant uh, um, uh, in these two tissues. But what was, was, what was absolutely amazing was the, the, the skin, uh, because as you can see, there is, this is the same magnification uh, of the treated and non-treated uh, animal. So there is a, an increase of all the, 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 the layer of the skin in, in terms of thickness, and this is clearly visible on this, uh, on this uh, staining. And uh, even more, uh, we, we checked that we were able to improve the, the hair growth uh, after uh, after shaving of this uh, of this animal by the treatment of of, of this uh, of this reprogramming, and then we to 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 come into the mechanism, uh, we look at the epigenetic uh, modification, uh, and first uh, we we decided to to identify on the metilome uh, of this animal what were the site of methylation um, submitted to, to this uh, epigenetic drift associated with the age. And we, we did that uh, uh, from 250,000 CPG. And uh, for each organ, we identified this aging uh, DMS associated to, 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 modify, uh, to this modification. And from this uh, aging DMS, we then identify organ per organ, what are the sites targeted by this reprogramming at two months, but also what, what are the resulting sites modified at eight months uh, among this aging D, uh, DMS. And what we observed was uh, uh, very interesting because uh, organ per organ, uh, we observed that uh, at, uh, there is some site modified uh, at eight months by the treatment, and the number of sites depend on the tissue. But what was absolutely interesting, it was that uh, still 100% of this site uh, recovered uh, a useful epigenetic information when, uh, when they are treated uh, early on. on on, uh, by the reprogramming factors. 
and this is uh, presented at, at example uh, for each tissue. And the more, please, uh, probably the more interesting uh, was that uh, this site at eight months recovered in, in, in epigenetic of full uh, information were not the same that the site uh, uh, induced uh, early on at two months. So it means that we, with this reprogramming early in the life, we initiated uh, uh, an epigenetic mechanism, which is not maintained, but propagated, and it restore useful epigenetic information on, on the aging depend, uh, DMS, depending on, on the tissue. Uh, it's, uh, this process also increased longevity in all age, improved body composition, tissue ultrastructure. It's also prevent uh, fibrosis and some age-related disease. So it's um, just to now to the last slide to, to thank um, uh, all the people uh, of the lab uh, who, who developed this, uh, this project and also uh, uh, all the platform involved in And just to, to say that uh, uh, in my lab, a uh, postdoc position is available to work on, uh, on transgenetry reprogramming. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean-Marc. Amazing talk. And it looks like Lorna can't be here today. So we have more time for questions. Actually, I learned about it after, after I sped you up. Sorry about that. And we just, already have... No, no, just... Yes. Sorry, she should come, but later. It, it's my bad. But uh, she should come, but, but later. But... Okay. okay. Uh, so now we have a, a few questions from the audience already. I will read them. Uh, you know, we have two pretty big ones. Uh, let me start with one and see. Um, uh, the person asks, applying Yamanaka factors leads to stem cells being made in the body and surely uh, these stem cells might be very helpful in general. For example, we know that all damaged um, uh, retinas could be repaired with injecting stem cells. But do we have any reason to believe that we get young stem cells and not old stem cells? How would that be measured? You mean you mean uh, uh, the delivery of, of, of stem cells in the animals by cell therapy? Uh, this is it, this is the it, question. Uh, as, as far as I understood, uh, probably the person meant uh, that uh, if we uh, make the reprogramming, uh, do we uh, uh, create younger cells or, or older cells? Uh, uh, yes, understood. with this uh, with this reprogramming model, uh, we because we show that we, we rejuvenate the cell physiology uh, even uh, by transient reprogramming. And because we, we reprogram all the cells of the animal, for sure, we, when we reprogram, we rejuvenate the cell. And this is probably the reason why we prevent uh, uh, age-related uh, uh, disease and deterioration of, of tissue. And it's not an injection of young stem cell uh, because we, we make the choice to, to, to develop a, a global strategy because probably uh, cell therapy for each tissue, age related disease will be a, a big nightmare in the future. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, uh, let's have another one from the audience. <laughs> Uh, I understand there is still no data by any group on lifespan improvement in healthy, not progeric animals. Why do you think that has been the, so elusive? Uh, you did show a slide on non-progeric uh, animals, but the effect seems to be tiny. No, it seems there is a big difference between compensating progeria and extending healthy lifespan. Also pretty big question, if you want to take on this. Yes, in, fa in fact, uh, as you know, uh, 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 mice uh, live longer than uh, <laughs> than uh, uh, sea elegants, for example. And, and uh, in fact, uh, when we we work on a progeric model, uh, we the, the lifespan in one year. Uh, so so it's it's easier to work with. And but as you as you saw, we also develop uh, um, uh, this reprogramming early on the life on, uh, on uh, non-progeric mice, but uh, we, we, we had to wait the, to, to see whether it improved longevity. So we decided to, 
to, to analyze tissue and so on uh, on the progeric mice because uh, it, was, uh, uh, it was done during the same times. Even more, we were scooped by <laughs> this laboratory of uh, Giuseppe Belmonte. So, so uh, you know, it's, but we did it. Uh, and we did it only with only one uh, reprogramming because we, we guessed that if we would like to go into clinic, uh, it's more efficient to make only one reprogramming. Okay, great. Uh, Patricia, you can ask your question directly if you want to unmute yourself. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Jean-Marc. C'était très bien. Uh, just a question. Did you compare uh, your cocktail with any other uh, molecule, whatever? Because from what I have understood, this early uh, challenging is so strategic. So it might be that several other possibilities are there and that the most important interesting question is not what you do, but when at what moment you are doing it. So, yes. you know, embryology is full of these examples. Yeah. Uh, and the very first 14 days, for instance, before, that aorta generates the two arteries of uh, the kidney is a strategic moment in which you have this high stem cell concentration at the branches, et cetera, et cetera. You know perfectly the literature of this. So why don't you study the moment instead of studying the cocktail? I, it's just a uh, just a... Yeah, 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 I understand. Uh, in, initially, uh, when we decided to, to develop different kinds of regimens uh, of reprogramming, uh, we, we, we developed many different things. And, uh, and uh, one, one first thing developed was to, to check the, 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 uh, the safety of the, this uh, induction. And uh, we started at two months because this is early on and, and we have the animal available. So we started with this initially to see the safety of the animal. And we continue then with this because we observed that uh, uh, late on the life, there, there was not teratoma, there was not uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, cancer cells and so on. And even more, we, we observed increased longevity. So it was the, the first uh, uh, test we, we had with, for the safety that, uh, that uh, trigger this kind of uh, analysis in the future, in fact. No, very, very interesting story. Yes, and then for sure now we have to do the, the, the similar uh, uh, thing with, uh, with uh, an induction late in the life. And this thank is you, ongoing. Thank you. Thank you. The, the last question is from Anton. Uh, why did you apply the treatment after two months and not when the mice were old and accumulated damage, epigenetic drift? Yes, the, this is the, the, the answer I, I did to Patricia. It's because uh, uh, initially, uh, initially uh, we, we, we started to induce the, the expression of, of the factor during a short period of time uh, to see uh, whether uh, there is a, it's, it was safe. And we observed at this time that th there was an effect even late in the life of the animal. And uh, it was the start of the story. <laughs> but actually, we, we have to to do additional experiment. And I'm, I'm, I'm agree that uh, we have to develop this in late animal. Yeah. Um, OK, uh, so uh, one last question for Walter. Huge interest, obviously. So one last question for Walter, because we really have to move on. Um, uh, I have been developing for three years a similar program to uh, repurpose longevity interventions for use on pregnant women. Uh, and then uh, through uh, the um, uh, development stage of life. Though the program has high uh, potential and accessibility, it is not well received due to the overwhelming focus on uh, salvaging elders. How will you overcome this barrier? Um, could, could, you, could you precise the question because- uh, Walter, uh, you, you wanna formulate yourself in your own words? Okay. Uh, the. So there's many other things. For instance, a well-known one is uh, uh, 
HMB and AKG, if you feed, for instance, if you feed those two pregnant sows, this was a fellow Tatara, uh, the, 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 uh, the piglets will come out 20% bigger. It's huge. It's a tremendous uh, improve. Unfortunately, we don't know what it affect on age because they killed the animals, but, um, but it looks very, has a high potential. And I believe that there's many other ways that you can minimize damage during pregnancy and development and, uh, and, and thus not only come out with stronger animals, that might be us, uh, but also extend their life. And there's, I think the evidence is overwhelming, but I can't get any traction because nobody's interested in something that, that takes 80 years to come to life. Nobody wants to extend the life of babies. They want to focus on older people. How do you get past that? Yes, uh, this, again, I think uh, I answered to, to, to the question. It was just uh, the life of research uh, because uh, uh, initially we, were, we wanted to, to know what was the effect of this reprogramming in, in a, a whole body of, of the animal. And uh, we, started, uh, we started with a, a young animal. Uh, but uh, for sure, uh, if we do if we do uh, uh, reprogramming early in the life, um, probably it's not so interesting. But we 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 already uh, observed that it improved lifespan. So maybe uh, if we do that late in the life, it, it can work also and increase lifespan and, and healthy lifespan. So we have to check that. What what was what was uh, uh, published by uh, the laboratory of Ocampo, uh, of uh, Giuseppe Belmonte, is that probably if you do something like that late, more late in the life, uh, the, the effect is probably uh, uh, lower. Uh, so we have to, to check that and to see whether first it improves longevity, because we don't know that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... So uh, uh, thanks for the great talk and we need to move on. Uh, okay. Lorna just arrived. Uh, and uh, so um, it is my pleasure to uh, start announcing her. Um, and um, uh, Lorna, you can already start sharing your screen. screen. Uh, Lorna Harris is a molecular geneticist at the University of Exeter College of Medicine and Health. And uh, she will present to us about uh, oligonucleotide cell therapies for the diseases of aging. Um, I don't see uh, uh, Lorna. Can you show yourself on screen? I don't know. I'm not sure I can. I only have one screen, but I am here. <laughs> You're already here. We see you. Okay, you see you and hear you. So it's fine. Thank you. Wonderful. So, so thank you very much, first of all, for the invite and the opportunity to tell you about some of the work that, that we've been doing over the, the last 15 years, really. So, um, so thanks for the, the invite there. Um, so I'm a professor of molecular genetics at Exeter, but I'm also founder and chief scientific officer of Sinisca, which is a spin out company that's that's grown out of our research. So we know now that aging and age related diseases share, um, they track back to one or two common causes. These are a series of interconnected basic health maintenance mechanisms that we all know as the hallmarks of aging, that when they're dysfunctional contribute to the aging process. So there are three criteria that need to be met before something is characterized as, as a hallmark. It needs to be present during normal aging, preferably in multiple species. It's experimental induction should promote aging, um, aging phenotypes and it's experimental ablation should improve aging phenotypes. And until very recently, there were nine recognized hallmarks, which include things like altered cellular, intracellular communications, telomere attrition, mitochondrial dysfunction and cellular senescence. But very recently, there have been another five hallmarks um, proposed, which include compromised autophagy, microbiome disruption, inflammation, altered mechanical processes, and this phenomenon called called splicing dysregulation. And I was really pleased to see this categorized as a hallmark. I've been shouting for about 15 years that I think this should be a hallmark. Uh, and I'm gonna present you some data today to show you indeed that we think it is, and that we can, um, and we can target this for rejuvenation of first nested cells. So 
the evidence, I think, that uh, dysregulated RNA processing is a hallmark. Um, so these are all data that have come out of my team, but there are also other, other studies that have come out of other people's work as well. But we showed back in 2011 that dysregulation of uh, splicing in particular um, is that the genes that regulate this process are amongst the most dysregulated during uh, aging in human populations. And we've shown this in multiple populations now. We've also shown that the factors that regulate uh, splicing decisions are dysregulated in senescent cells. Of all the lineages we've looked at so far, we've looked at over 12 different cell lineages and we always see it. Uh, we've also shown that splicing factors are dysregulated in progeroid syndrome. So in fibroblasts from people with hutchinson gilbert progeria or Werner's syndrome, they have splicing factor profiles that look remarkably like those of, of old wild hutch cells. We've shown that it's associated with lifespan in animals and also in humans and that it's causally involved in response to dietary restriction. And in some work that came from Ben Lee and my team um, a few years ago now, we also show that splicing factor expression is predictive of human aging phenotypes, including cognitive dysfunction and frailty. So I'm gonna take a little bit of an aside now for those of you who are not so familiar with RNA processing, who don't love it as much as I do, but so, so what is it? So basically it's the collection of processes that have to happen to a primary transcript or it can be turned into a mature transcript to make a protein, or not, as the case may be, as we now know that some RNAs don't actually make proteins. There are three basic steps. There's the addition of a five prime cap. This is important for initiation of translation and also for stability. The addition of a poly A tail, which is necessary for uh, RNA stability, and also for the removal of these non-coding introns that separate the of, uh, of RNA here that are coding these introns. So this is the central dogma of molecular biology. It's what we've been teaching our undergraduates for decades, and it's unfortunately not correct. So 98% of our of our um, transcript of, of our genome actually produces more than one product. So most genes make an average of about three isoforms, but there are extremes. So there are several mechanisms by which this can uh, this could happen. Um, you can get alternative promoters or you can get alternative poly polyethylation sites, but probably the most predominant mechanism is alternative splicing. So this is a, a mix and match, basically, of the different exons in the transcript. So some isoforms have some of them, but not others. Um, and you can get independent isoforms, which are independently transcribed, uh, independently translated to make you know, whatever they, that gene makes. They can be expressed at different times in different places, and they're a really fundamental underpinning of the molecular response to stress. And they're absolutely critical for um, transcriptomic adaptability and plasticity. So why should these genes be involved in senescence? So the simple answer to that is they don't just do splicing, they do lots of other stuff as well. So of course, when they're dysregulated, you get gene and wide dysregulation of splicing also get an increase in aberrant splicing, which is a problem because these proteins are also involved in RNA surveillance. So they're part of the RNA QC processes. So these transcripts, which normally would be degraded, start to accumulate. They're involved in RNA export. So you get um, faulty transport of, of transcripts from the nucleus. They're also involved in impaired transcriptomic response to cellulite salt. Of particular relevance to senescence, involved in destabilization of cytokine RNAs. So when, you, when they're dysregulated, you get these, these, these RNAs get stabilized and hang around longer. And they're also involved in telomere maintenance. So actually it's not really to me that surprising that these things are involved in senescence because they, do, they, they interface with so many senescence related processes. So showed a few years ago now that you can actually attenuate spl splicing map factor expression with small molecules. So this heat map here, this is, um, are human primary dermal fibroblasts, old, old cells, six different analogues of a phenol compound. Um, and red is down and green is up. And you can see these are the controls here and these are after treatment. And you can see that pretty much all of our leading edge splicing factors here, these are the ones which came top in our epidemiology. These are all switched back on when we attenuate with small molecules. This is accompanied by changes in the splicing to some uh, very important senescence genes, as you can see here. So we can attenuate the expression of these things in, in vitro, at least. When we attenuate splicing factor expression, this is associated with about a two thirds drop in the senescent cell load of the cultures. So in this top panel here, these are, again, these are dermal fibroblasts and about 71% senescence assessed by SAB. These are treated cells, now about 24% senescence. So you can see, as I said, about a two thirds drop in the senescent cell load. This is accompanied by about a two thirds uplift in the proliferation index. So cells have re-entered cell cycle. 
this is a senomorphic effect, not a senolytic effect. So we don't see any increases in cell death. We also are able to rebuild our telomeres. So this is key PCR data. Um, these are our control old cells. These are young cells for comparison. And these are cells treated with a variety of analogues of other molecules we were interested in at the time. And you can see all of these actually have brought about a telomere elongation. In some cases, up to the same sorts of levels as we're seeing in young cells. And the final proof of the pudding, really, that these things are causal is that if we knock them down in young cells, this is sufficient to induce senescence. So this time, this is in endothelial cells. And here we've taken young endothelial cells and we've knocked out one or the other of a selection of different splicing factors, but I've just shown you two of them here. And when we knock these down in just one gene in isolation, this is enough to induce senescence. So this is proof that these things are on the causal side of the equation. So why these things dysregulated during aging? Well, to cut a very long story short, it's because of constitutive and unresolved activation of a couple of cellular signaling pathways, including ERK, and AKT. And these pathways, are, of course, very important for lots of things in the cell. And of course, they interface with a lot of other signaling pathways. Um, and together, these pathways can be activated by things like DNA damage, inflammation, dysregulation of growth, uh, growth factors and oxidative stress, which, of course, are all classical aging stimuli. So in a, in a therapeutic setting, we wouldn't necessarily want to be attenuating ERK or AKT signaling because they're very pleiotropic within the cell. So we went hunting for what the effector genes were. And again, to cut a long story short, we tied it down to these two genes here. So the, these are two genes. One is ETV6 and one is FOXO1. FOXO1 is, of course, a very old friend to the longevity field, first longevity gene ever discovered, but never previously been tied into splicing regulation. ETV6, really a bit of a black box. No one had ever really describe this in much detail for anything, actually. When we knock them down individually, and again, we're back in primary human dermal fibroblasts here, you can see that knockdown of either ETV6 or FOXO1 is sufficient to restore splicing factor expression relative to old cells. Interestingly, when we knock them down together, the effect is negated. So this is evidence of an autoregulatory feedback loop that, and a cross-regulatory feedback loop also between these two proteins what's happening with senescence? Well, when we knock down either ETV6 or FOXO1, we see a drop in the, in the senescent cell load in the culture. This is also associated with an increase in cell cycle when you knock them down one at a time. When we knock them down together, however, the effect is ablated. And we, we, see, um, we see no effect on senescent cell load and we see no effect on proliferation. So we have characterized this feedback loop and we can see, so we know, we know what's going on here, but these two pathways talk to each other and the, the genes indeed talk to each other as well. So what do these genes do? Well, they're transcriptional regulators. They turn other genes on and off. And because of the evidence that we had that they are, um, they're cross-regulatory, we were interested in their common targets. So we did some chromatin immunoprecipitation studies whereby we, we fished out the genes which were co-regulated by FOXO1 and ETV6. And we identified a panel of 242 genes, which were common targets of these two transcriptional regulators. And when we look at what those genes do by gene set enrichment analysis, what pops out is senescence. They're also configured, a lot of these genes are configured in auto-regulatory loops. So this then gives us a unique opportunity for targeting. Many genes that are important in maintenance of homeostasis for many different mechanisms in the cell are actually configured in these sorts of loops, which allows us to target them in a very specific context. And we found several loops involving, as I said, involving our target genes in senescence that we can modify with oligonucleotides to modulate the effect. So this is what these loops tend to look like. So we have our target genes, which actually auto-regulate as well as cross-regulate. So they, they hold themselves in a Goldilocks zone. These genes exert a negative pressure on a bunch of senescence genes, including P16 and P21. Then that in turn, these genes are responsible for coding for a set of intermediates that negatively regulate our target. So that's how they're configured. We're looking to target these loops using oligonucleotides in a therapeutic context. So, well, why oligonucleotides? We can use an oligonucleotide um, to target the relationship between the regulated targets and what is regulating them in a very precise manner to restore splicing factor expression and ameliorate the negative effects of senescence. And we're doing this in the context of age-related diseases. 
Triggers are super useful because you can use them to switch genes on. If you sit them over negative regulatory elements, you can use them to switch genes on. You can switch genes off using conventional siRNA, or you can target positive regulatory elements. You can even use them to influence splicing, so you can make cells make whatever isoforms you want them to make by putting, putting your, oligo, your oligo over the control regions. They've got a number of, of advantages over your conventional targets. You can use them to drug undruggable targets. So if you're using a small molecule modality, you are reliant on there being a convenient binding pocket that you can target. Using an oligo, you can target pretty much any part of the gene. The chemistries are well understood and evolving, and we can use low doses. So in our hands, we have these down to about a nanomolar. You can administer them very precisely with very, off, very little off-target effect because of the nature of the specificity of that association. And if you administer them locally, you get very little systemic exposure, particularly at the doses we're using. So how are we using them? So if we come back to our loop, here's a, a young healthy cell. Our target gene is, is in its Goldilocks zone. It's expressing itself within its natural physiological bounds, it's exerting a negative regulatory pressure on the senescence genes. Now, this loop is therefore silent. As we age, we lose our splicing regulators. So this gene starts to fall out of homeostasis. You lose this block here. The switch gets, the, the, these genes get switched on, producing the intermediate, which comes around and switches our gene off even more. So this is in fact a biphasic switch for senescence. What we're doing is we're inter interfering with this. So in our old cells, our senescence genes are active, the intermediates are active, but we're sitting out oligo, the binding site here, but it can't interact with our target. Target gene starts to rescue, then is held in check its own autoregulation in its natural homeostatic range. Sw switch flips, senescence genes start to get turned off, intermediate gets switched off, and our cell is now back in its natural homeostatic range and rejuvenated. But just to show you how this actually does work in, in normal cells. So these are human primary lung. These are young cells at population doubling about 20. These are the same population at population doubling 84. So this is replicative senescence. All of these panels are stained with SAB, but of course you can't see anything here because they're young. The old cells, and you can see they've picked up the SAB. The morphology is also very characteristic of senescent lung. These are basically the same culture, but treated without oligo. So you can see the morphology has come back to where they were before. We are still seeing some senescent cells in here, and we will because some senescent cells are senescent because they've got catastrophic damage. We're also starting to see a little bit of uh, formation of these mitotic foci as we see in the young cells. So this works in young, in old, normal cells. When we look at what the kinetics look like, so this is senescence measured by SAP, at a 55% drop in senescent cell load. We also see a drop when measured with P16. Not all senescent cells are P16 positive, um, so the effects are not quite as marked, you'll see it. We're also seeing about a 30% drop in the DNA damage load in the cultures. So this is measured by gamma H2AX. We're seeing a little bit of uh, initiation of proliferation here again. So some of the cells have come back into cell cycle. Because we are interested primarily in the first instance in the context of fibrotic lung disease as an exemplar disease of aging that we can, we can explore with our new oligos. We're looking at markers of fibrosis. Um, old lung cells show a lot of the same fibrotic markers as do cells with, uh, from patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, for example. So these three genes here are, mar are fibrotic markers. The two is actually a transdifferentiation marker that picks out cells which are transdifferentiated to myofibroblasts and laying down aberrant matrix. Our oligos can switch this back down, indicating that they've gone back to fibroblasts. Collagen 1A1, of course, a very important component of the fibrotic extracellular matrix. Our oligos are, are shutting down the expression of this. Gremlin 1 is the, one of the initiating cascades of fibrosis. We're able to switch that down. Conversely, if we're looking at markers of, of um, anti-fibrotic effects and fibrosis resolution, this gene here, LIF, is a gene that negatively regulates collagens um, and it's associated with protection against fibrosis in lung, liver and kidney. And we're seeing this is beginning to get switched up. We have capthecin L and hemoxidase 1, which are antifibrotic markers. And this oligo in particular is, is pretty potent with these. We're getting a nice switch up. This oligo, and this um, gene here, MMP14, is collagenase 9. Um, and we're able to switch this up. So this raises the interesting perspective that we might not only be able to stop fibrosis, but we may potentially even be able to start to resolve it. So we're harnessing this in the context of IPF. So in IPF, you get an epithelial cell insult, which causes the epithelia to become senescent. 
secreted sap that then goes through into the stroma, and then that causes senescence in the fibroblasts. Fibroblasts then get, uh, because of TGF beta, get elicited to turn into myofibroblasts, which elicits the fibrotic effects. And concurrently, because your immune system is also senescent, you don't get the clearance. And because your stem cell compartments are also senescent, you don't get the repair and resolution that you would see in a younger individual. So the thinking is that removal of rejuvenation of senescent cells will actually address multiple aspects of fibrosis and repair. So just in my last few slides, um, we're starting to look at this in the context of IPF. So the first thing we showed was that cells from IPF patients are prematurely senescent. So this is a young, uh, a young population of, of normal lung cells, typical fibroblast morphology. They're dividing, as you can see by the um, 67 foci here, and actually not very much damage. These at the bottom, these are cells from a 55-year-old male IPF patient. The cells are passage matched. So they're both at around 25 population doubling. And you can just immediately see that the difference in the cell morphologies, you've got a lot of senescence in here. A little bit less proliferation. They're still young cells, so you would still expect some of the cells to have proliferative capacity, a lot more damage. And when we graph that, we can see our senescent cell load is about four times higher. We have about 20% less division, and again, about four to five times more DNA damage. So what happens when we treat these cells? So what you're looking at here is just a slightly higher magnification with a tagged oligo so that you can see we're getting it into the cells. This is what our young cells look like. These are the young normal cells. These are our young IPS cells. And again, you can see the collection of senescent cells here. And these two panels here are IPS cells, but treated with two of our oligos. And you can see just, just by looking, you can actually see the fibroblast morphology has kind of come back where it should be. As I say, we still have some senescent cells, but nowhere near as many. When we graph that, we have about 50% about of our senescent cells, uh, senescent cell load has, no, has come down. We do see a, a, an increase in proliferation. Um, I think this is probably reactivation of some of the quiescent cells in the population, which is why we see so much of it. But I think some of those senescent cells may well have, have gathered a little bit of ability to divide. We're seeing a lot less DNA damage, about four, four to five times less DNA damage in the case of Sol45. We're also seeing a reduction in, in inflammation. So IL-6, which is your post gene for the SAST, uh, certainly in lung, we've got about a two thirds drop in SAST. We're starting to see a nudging up of the antifibrotic markers. To see these properly, we really need to get these cells on a matrix and do a much more um, in-depth experiment, but we are starting to see them moving. So targeting splicing dysregulation may be a fruitful source of new senotherapeutics. So to conclude, Regulation of RNA processing is a new and druggable hallmark of human aging. And splicing factors can be restored in aging human cells using small molecules or genetic interventions like oligonucleotides. And this influences senescence phenotypes. And targeted moderation of splicing factor expression can influence not only senescence phenotypes, but also attenuate disease markers in cells from patients with premature aging diseases. I'll just finish with some acknowledgements. So this has been about 15 years work in the making. And obviously over that time, it's involved a lot of collaboration. And so this is my team. The, the guys picked out in sort of pale blue here are my academic team. The guys in, in white are my Sinisca team. And there are some past lab members who've been involved in this work. And then the other people I'd like to particularly draw attention to are the, uh, the, the team at the NIH. So Luigi Ferrucci and his team who've been were instrumental with the, the epidemiology and uh, colleagues at the University of Brighton who helped us out with the very first study with the polyphenol analogues. So I'll finish there and I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you, thank you very much, Lorna. We have time for a couple of questions. Uh, so the first is from Leon. By the way, if you prefer to ask yourself, you're welcome. Uh, if <laughs> not, uh, <laughs> the DNA mutilation has been connected to slicing uh, before. Do you see or plan to look into the effect of DNA uh, mutilation uh, with your intervention? Yeah, we've done this actually. Um, it, not a very exhaustive study. Um, what we see when we're looking at the methylation clocks, we start off with cells that are about 64, the, um, the young, and then we can rejuvenate them back to about 18 or 19 actually. We've only done this one or two times and we are actually working up some um, transcriptomic clocks at the level of splicing, which are one of the outcome measures that we will be using to, to assess this. Okay, great. Um, and uh, Anton, once again, if you want to ask yourself, just raise your hand. Okay, uh, okay, I can ask. Uh, so, uh, you mean uh, 
so right now you mostly apply it to uh, cell cultures. But yes. when you will uh, apply it to the whole organism, you can uh, have a situation that uh, uh, it's very important for some genes to have very different alternative isoforms uh, uh, in different tissues. How do yes. you control that you accidentally don't break uh, it between tissues? Sure. So there's, there's two answers to that question. So the first answer in a therapeutic um, context, this is one of the reasons why we are using oligos and we're using them locally so that we can deliver them directly to the target organ and then um, and the risk of systemic exposure at, at the doses we're using is actually fairly minimal. That said, even in a systemic context, actually, the risk is not is that there's not an issue because we're not making these splicing factors do anything. We're not pushing them into a range that they wouldn't normally be at. So we're, we're nudging them back into their normal natural homeostasis where they will self-regulate as they would normally without intervention. So we're just giving them a, a helping hand back into that homeostatic range. Thank you. And uh, Aubrey asked a question. Aubrey, do you want to ask yourself uh, or should I read it? Uh, yeah, sure. I'll ask it. Um, yeah, so uh, it's the standard question that you've had a thousand times before, Lauren. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, but uh, yeah, I thought it would be worthwhile not to have it omitted today. Um, yes. As in, um, so w why would we want to rejuvenate senescent cells since they're bad for us and there aren't very many? Right. Them, OK. So. All right. So the first answer to that is, as, as I think most of us know, there's not just one type of senescent cell. OK, so some cells are senescent because they have massive damage and that they've become senescent as a protection against malignancy. Those ones we will not be able to touch. Those ones have got ongoing damage signals which are pushing, you know, pushing our regulators out of their homeostasis, activating those pathways constantly. So there's no way we'll be able to do those. Um, in terms of why we would want to rejuvenate them, I think it's not so much rejuvenate them. What we really want to do is to stop them doing the bad stuff that they're doing. So actually the, the primary outcome here is to stop them releasing the SAS. The other thing, of course, is that not all senescent cells are bad for you. Some senescent cells, and we're beginning to know now that especially in places like the lung, there are niches of senescent cells that are actually necessary for wound, you know, for, for remodeling and for wound healing. So those types of senescent cells will not be dysregulated. They will not have the splicing factor dysregulation because that that they're still capable of, of, of keeping them in their homeostatic range. So we won't touch those. I think the ones that we are actually rejuvenating are the ones which are senescent because of the paracrine action. And I think, you know, I'm not worried about making them divide. I don't want to completely reanimate them. What I want them to do is to stop secreting the sas. Thanks. Uh, and the last question for Patricia, if you want to, to ask, and we have to move on. Uh, you still oh, muted. You're muted, Patricia. <laughs> I, I right. Just to say, it was a fantastic talk. Oh, thank and, you. Uh, very enthusiastic uh, person. <laughs> uh, You've got to love what you do. If you don't love it, no one else is going to love it. Very nice. I just wondered in your constitutive pathway list you uh, showed if you ever looked to uh, raw R, because in endothelial cells specifically, the inhibition uh, by uh, finalization of raw R has been shown to stop oncotransformation and as thus. So this would have to be included, I think. Yeah, we haven't looked at that so far, but interestingly, there are a couple of uh, our targets that come up in our list. Mm -hmm. That's so yeah, I mean, it's on the it's on the list of things. We, we have a massive list of, of pa pathways and processes we want to look at. That will be on the academic side, though, not not in the, um, the no, industrial okay, setting. But still, there yes. are small molecules that are specifically doing the job. Absolutely. Okay. okay, great, great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lorena, for this talk. And uh, our next speaker uh, that you can already start sharing your slides is uh, Professor Andrea uh, Brita Meyer, who is a professor of medicine, healthy aging and dementia research. Uh, she is the co director of the Center for Healthy A Longevity at the Faculty of Medicine in Singapore. And uh, she will present about uh, shaking up healthcare. Uh, healthy longevity medicine. Uh, so uh, yes, please. Usually there is some delay before the person shows up on screen. Uh, so yeah, I I'm I there. If you can see me on my screen, now we can. Now we okay, are here. great, great. Um, thank you for for having me. 
Um, as a couple of you know, I started at the National University of Singapore one and a half years ago. And what I would like to do today is to present you what kind of structure we, we set up. Because I think in our field of healthy longevity medicine, we need structure to be able to produce good results. Um, and that's the reason why I've never used that, that title, Shaking Up Healthcare. As many know, I'm an internal medicine specialist and geriatrician, and I'm living in the healthcare system, but I think it really needs, uh, needs a shake up. What you see here in the picture is Alexandra Hospital, and that's the hospital where we are starting a longevity clinics and really try to um, implement them in, uh, in whole Singapore in the end. Um, to have a system uh, about longevity medicine, about prevention, targeting aging, you need, as I already said, a framework, but first you need science. And I think that we have enough science to already bring it into clinical practice in a, in a bigger scale. You need diagnostics and you need uh, interventions. So to implement anything, you need first healthcare professionals, consumers, et cetera, to be aligned. And that's the reason why we founded in August of this year, the Healthy Longevity Medicine Society. Um, we, we did that after long lasting discussions to see what aims are, et cetera. And I will show you in a second uh, what it is, but we first started to have white um, of round table discussions to actually see what, what, what is what we do. I know what an internal medicine specialist is doing. I know what an endocrinologist is doing. I know what a surgeon is, is doing. So we defined um, healthy longevity medicine and we defined it as optimizing health span by targeting aging processes across the lifespan. So that is our working definitions, which will be uh, published uh, soon. There is a website, uh, you can see that um, on the right hand side, there is the bottom membership if you are interested. It's really for healthcare professionals, but also for researchers and laymen and other societies, our uh, policymakers are, are welcome. Um, here you see the founders of the Health and Longevity Medicine Society. Um, so you see a range of specialities in their uh, neurology, internal medicine, uh, geriatrics, psychiatry, uh, oncology, uh, etc. Uh, what we did in the past months, we had lots of meetings uh, with interested uh, clinician scientists because we have to built the crowd, not many had ever any lecture during the medical studies or had any education in longevity medicine. So you just see a photo on the right hand side of our network meeting in Singapore we had in September, and now we are uh, around the world to actually bring clinician scientists uh, together or clinicians who are interested to change their, their work. What is this society doing? Um, three main uh, objectives. Uh, that is to educate. I think that's very important. Um, we are educating healthcare professionals, but I must say that I, most of my time I spend in educating also politicians in Singapore, and they are very involved uh, because they are shaping the regulations, and that's what we what we need. And what we also want to do is to get uh, health and longevity medicine as a recognized speciality into uh, the system of uh, societies, medical societies. And um, not only that, that I can then do my work as a healthy longevity medicine physician, because it's not a recognized uh, speciality uh, yet. I know many of us are using that terminology, but um, I wouldn't say it's fraud, but it's not existing. Um, but it's also very important. If you have a speciality, you can train individuals in the regulatory system. So you can train uh, physicians, you can train medical students. And that's the reason why we then have a better chance to also get into, into the curricula. And not only in the curricula of the biology of aging of biologists, uh, but also in the MD curricula. We want to increase quality. I think that we are so successful in the field um, that we have lots of output in terms of research that's being translated into a non-regulated um, sector, very often referred to as the um, wellness sector. Um, that, that's not bad, absolutely not. I love innovation. But what I also love is to have standards and, and guidelines where we know what's working, what's not working, and actually to educate individuals where there is evidence and where there is no evidence. 
and to make that distinction that we can guide consumers, we can guide healthcare professionals, and we can guide also investors. Um, furthermore, and this is most dear to my heart next to the, the guidelines, is to accelerate actually what we are doing. In the first talk, uh, it was mentioned how many trials do we now have and we don't accelerate, I think it will never happen. So we need trial networks, as we already know in uh, other specialities and in, in medicine and um, other subjects of, of we, we are working in, they, they all have big networks. and. Um, there is uh, lots of trials in the hypertension field, endocrinology field, and oncology field, why lots of continents work together. So we are now building a trial network for the longevity medicine uh, field. If you're interested to be part of that, please uh, let me know, uh, because we are starting that trial network. And the first thing is to standardize, to standardize how we do things, um, how we take blood even, how we um, uh, it, it take uh, uh, biopsies, uh, etc. But also, how do we measure muscle strength or muscle mass? So it's really about standardization at this moment in time, exchanging processes, and then um, getting funding for our first trials. If you're interested, the first General Assembly meeting is at the 14th of uh, December with all our members already. It's a big group already. If you uh, don't want to miss out, please uh, let me know and go to our website and uh, we will invite you. Um, what is the core structure? Uh, and I think that this slide is, is now most dear to my heart because it works with um, uh, big investors and it also works especially with uh, the politicians I'm talking to. We know that the organ performance is uh, declining and there's chronological age on the horizontal axis. At a certain age, you have a chronic disease. And I do as an internal medicine specialist, I uh, always dichotomize, yes, it's good, it's not good, come again in a, in, a, in, a, in a month's time or sometimes a year time to measure the glucose again and hypertension. And that doesn't work anymore. In Singapore, we are heavily investing uh, in prevention, but what we mean with prevention is rescuing individuals, especially at older age, to have a disease in the end. So what we are doing, we are rescuing a, a patient with a very high glucose level, which is not yet meeting the criteria of having diabetes, and to say, okay, let's do lifestyle approaches. That's not enough. Um, what I realized that I never did in my clinical practice, and that's a little bit an omission, I must say for myself, that if I have a very optimal functional individual at the age of uh, 60 to 80, I never asked that person if this is the optimized uh, function that person have. Because we are very often as clinicians, we say, yes, it's good. It's very good. It's very, very good in the green zone. It's absolutely not abnormal. But what we do not know and we are trying with lots of projects at the moment with sports medicine and um, uh, doctors who are really training this top sporters who are now also doing the football um, in a certain country. Uh, we really try to see, OK, what is the optimal performance of that individual in trying to um, to 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 individualize the interventions? And of course, we have to start much, much earlier. So in our longevity clinic, we are individuals from the age of 30 uh, onwards without any disease. And this is what the Longevity Medicine Society really wants to do, writing guidelines, helping individuals to start these kind of clinics. And I would also say that at least in Singapore, we have a couple of projects where we try to optimize the health of individuals who want to become pregnant, males and females to see if we can optimize the health of the individuals much, much earlier in life and give them a good start. Um, this is our framework in Singapore. Uh, we have a preclinical group uh, led by Brian Kennedy, uh, the clinical group led by myself. Uh, we are starting the, the clinics, bringing it into practice and bringing it into public health. Um, the public health component is at the moment quite, quite big because there's just a very hard push into prevention. We do that with private public partnerships and we do that with certain hospitals and we are now building a hospital group and a network to bring it what is evidence uh, based into practice. And uh, I already mentioned Healthier SG, so that's a preventative uh, program where um, 
it's quite cost driven so individuals get a certain budget and they can decide themselves where to spend it on so you don't have to wait until you have a disease but you can say okay i want to spend the money i get from the government to prevent an age related disease so here a uh, very good opportunities uh, kick in we also have a health district at queenstown um, which means that we have an entire sector where uh, 400,000 individuals are living, where especially social housing is. 80% of Singaporeans live in social housing. And um, we are now asked to redesign the entire structure of that, uh, that district and to make it healthier, to stimulate healthier lives, but also to include biomarkers, uh, for example. Um, to, to build that framework further, I already uh, alluded to the Health Longevity Medicine Society, we are stimulating lots of ed education, I will have a slide in the end, uh, where we really focus on the executive ma and masters and crash courses. Um, we built a diagnostic core, uh, I already mentioned diagnostics is uh, very important, and especially the standardization of diagnostics, if you want to compare different studies, and especially if you have human material, that um, an outcome A means really outcome A is not B. Um, so we built a core to measure the biological age, not only clocks, but also looking at pathways and targets, and then the intervention core. And I will show you a couple of um, examples what we are doing at the moment in the randomized control trial uh, space. Very important on that point is that everything is standardized, that we can also compare the different randomized control trials and the effect sizes to each other, that these are the building blocks of um, individual interventions that we can in the end combine them uh, very, very soon. This is the framework uh, of what we are doing in terms of intervention and what kind of uh, diagnostics we do. Uh, very importantly, we uh, include a huge amount of clinical phenotyping so from a few to max to um, a very extensive cognitive screening to uh, measurements imaging, uh, for example, fMRI. We do a, a huge investment at the moment in digital phenotyping. We're always happy to learn. So um, if you want to um, uh, reach out, that would be uh, great. So we have lots of uh, devices 24-7 uh, measuring the physiology of our uh, randomized controlled trial participants. And of course, we have the multi-omics technology etc. Everybody knows you in the room. Most importantly, in terms of the intervention that we include the environment, if the noise level where you are sleeping in is bad, I think we will not reunite that, um, uh, that, that body. And at least we are measuring at the moment and how much sun uh, somebody is exposed to and how much noise, um, etc. Lifestyle interventions, we are doing really linking them to the hallmarks of aging and doing lots of supplements and new um, repurposed drugs uh, studies. Um, these are the uh, studies we are doing at the moment. Um, what we are doing at the Center for Health and Longevity, we have the pipeline from animal studies of different animal models to uh, the human uh, studies. And uh, once we see an effect in the, in the animals, we will bring it into uh, the human uh, studies. Um, alpha ketoglutarate, I think everybody knows here in the room. I will show you in a second how that works um, or might work. Rapamycin, Rapalox uh, is starting a Rapamycin a study, urolicin age and Pibrazole and Glycin. The slide is a little bit outdated because we not just um, decided also to do a Fisitin and a Spermidin uh, study in humans because now we have positive results in, um, in the animal uh, models. Uh, you might know uh, alpha ketoglutarate. It's really um, polymorphic in terms of the, the function and then the hallmarks uh, it's, uh, it's touching. Uh, and therewith, it's quite interesting because it might manipulate lots of physiological functions and physiological organ systems in, uh, in humans. And that's depicted uh, here. So all these outcome parameters are being measured, uh, including oral health, uh, et cetera, in our RCTs. And that led to the ABLE study. It's a double uh, blinded randomized controlled trials. So we're giving one gram uh, of calcium AKG. We only give one gram because it's really hard to swallow. So I think that's... Uh, a side uh, thing uh, we have to um, take care of that people can actually take the supplements. And then six uh, months and three months uh, follow up, 40 to 60 year old healthy individuals. And these healthy individuals, uh, middle-aged, have to have a higher biological age measured by um, an epigenet uh, the epigenetic, the methylation uh, clocks. And we are combining different algorithms 
of these clocks four different and make a composite score out of it because I don't think that we know which epigenetic clock is the best one. And the primary outcome is also the epigenetic uh, age. Um, so that's ongoing. Uh, we just uh, finished uh, our study with uh, NMN. Uh, everybody here in the room knows that uh, NED levels go down. So the entire idea is while supplementing with NMN that might be uh, positive effects to um, human longevity, but especially also the functioning of lots of organ uh, systems, um, such as the liver, brain, uh, etc. I know that there are lots of study already in the ophthalmology uh, field. We also know I'm involved in. I think which is uh, which is great, and they are big, uh, big studies. Um, here is our smaller uh, uh, study I was involved in: 80 men, 50 years of age, no chronic disease, healthy, and a man for 60 uh, days um, in a dose-dependent uh, measure. So there's of course a placebo with randomized controlled trial, double-blinded, um, as we should do it: 300 milligram, 600 milligram, and 900 milligram and only show you a couple of outcome parameters. Uh, first of all, NED levels were higher, which is, I think, important. The highest increase uh, around 600 milligram, no much further increase of 900 uh, milligram. Um, and I show you the six minute walking test and uh, especially also the SF36, which is a quality of life uh, marker and uh, a highly established one in all randomized controlled trial of the more conventional uh, medicine type. And what you can see is that uh, people um, if they are taking 600 milligram or 900 milligram of NMN for 60 uh, days, they have um, a longer walking uh, distance, uh, so which is uh, what we want to see, and they, higher, they report a higher quality of life compared to placebo. So that's encouraging, and that's the reason why we are starting a much bigger uh, trial soon. We uh, prepare at the moment our rapamycin, um, a randomized controlled trial, our longer uh, study. And before we do our trials, uh, we always do systematic reviews. We do that at the moment also for Ulysses and A. We did that for AKG. So here you see the results, the first results of our rapamycin a ra a systematic review, uh, where we actually looked at different system, uh, physiological systems on the left-hand side and everything is green, has a positive effect, um, which is a little bit of yellow, uh, whitish, has no effect, and red is uh, no effect, and the crosses, the red crosses, is not being, being measured. And what you can see is, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, uh, we, we have lots of hope for, for rapamycin, and these are, of course, these are just human uh, studies in healthy individuals. Um, it sometimes can be questionable how much effect uh, it has. It has absolutely an effect on the immune system, but that's also the reason why I give uh, repam lepralox and rapamycin to my transplant uh, patients. So it seems to work also in healthy individuals, but I think we will need much, much bigger trials to see what the real effect is on, on healthy longevity. So that's the reason why we are starting the longer uh, study double-blinded randomized controlled trial six milligram uh, of uh, rapamycin per week, uh, three weeks long and then one week uh, off, and then three weeks again, one week off, um, and uh, three months of follow-up and six months of uh, giving it. Again, in 40 uh, to 60 um, a year old healthy individuals. We really struggled a lot with the primary outcome. I think there's no good primary outcome in our trials yet, but we have chosen um, the CRP and other uh, biological uh, measures. Um, so this is, yes, I think we can diagnose. I haven't shown you the data of our UK biobank analysis, um, but I think we, we all think that there are good clocks already and we have interventions that let that we are starting the longevity medicine clinics in, in Singapore in quarter one, 2023, um, which are publicly funded. I also start with my first longevity clinic privately. Um, in two weeks time, we are opening, which is very exciting in, in Singapore. And we are heavily investing in education. So if um, you're interested in 2023 in May, we have the first executive program where we are teaching uh, senior managers, bringing a very selective group of senior managers together in uh, together 2025 is a, is a maximum. It's a little bit the INSEAD of health we are creating. Um, please uh, let me know. Also in 23, in, in April, we have our first summer schools uh, to really be able to uh, educate also the youngsters. And in 2025, we have the first uh, master degrees. 
Uh, you might also know that we have weekly webinars uh, on Thursdays. Uh, it's very easy to find in US Center for Health and Longevity webinars, and you will find it free of charge. So please be our guest. And thank you for the attention. Uh, happy to have some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea, for this uh, great talk. Uh, I will use uh, my privilege as uh, the chair to ask the first uh, question, something that really inter interests me, uh, in relation to your talk, but also to your recent paper in the Lancet Health and Longevity, uh, where you defined, and the entire WHO working group defines uh, the metrics for, for intrinsic capacity, basically the metrics for healthy aging. Uh, so uh, my question is, um, how likely do you think that those metrics, those standards, will be used by everybody? I mean, uh, right now, uh, pretty much every researcher has uh, uh, his or her uh, metrics of aging of, of their own. Uh, so uh, it basically depends on their equipment that simply cannot measure anything outside of the equipment. So um, how optimistic um, uh, are you about the dissemination of your, of your uh, standards and uh, what are you going to do to make them more, uh, more consensus, more, uh, more accepted? Now, I'm, I'm a very optimistic person. <laughs> Uh, I know it's hard because I'm a clinician and I, I manage physicians. It's very hard uh, to get them on one line. However, if regulations say that you have to do it in a certain way, people will do it because otherwise uh, it will not be accepted. And I think I don't like that approach because it's a very <laughs> a little bit German approach. You have to do it this way and there is no other way. But I think at least um, we should standardize in a way that we can... Um, we can compare effect size. And I think that's really missing at this moment in time. So I'm very optimistic. If I look at other fields, they also, they standardized approaches, for example, in Europe, um, how you screen for diabetes, how you screen for cardiovascular disease. We have very accepted in um, uh, phase four studies, primary outcomes, which are accepted by the uh, FDA and the EMA. And that's what we need in our field. What you do with your secondary outcome parameters I wouldn't care because that can be very explorative, but I think we have to be united in the field. And that's what I try to hope to achieve um, with the society, but, but, but also with the entire network here. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, time for a couple more questions. Uh, maybe from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, John Ferber, I heard, I saw, yeah, uh, John Ferber, Andrea. Uh, have there been any comparisons of uh, expensive oral NMN versus cheap oral and nicotinic acids uh, niacin? Great question. Uh, we are doing at this moment, I spent a fortune of, of money to buy, uh, I, I can say that we are testing at the moment your listen A and NMN to actually to see uh, what's, it, what's written on the bottle, if inside the bottle. And we also do in vitro uh, tests to look at mechanisms they should target to actually see if they are doing it. Next to that, we're also looking at toxins and, and other ingredients which might be in the bottle, which should not be in the bottle. So watch the space and the RDD next uh, year, we will have all the results um, from not only the testing of the ingredients, but also the in vitro um, uh, experiments for these two. But we will, we will test much, much more. Thank you. And uh, Jose, you can also ask directly if you want, uh, or I can read yes. you can ask. Uh, yes, please. Uh, excellent presentation, Andrea. And um, I am very happy that you are starting with a longevity clinic in Singapore. So how is it different or similar to other longevity clinics like uh, Human Longevity or uh, Fountain uh, Life Clinics? Yeah, good, good question. I don't, I don't want to advertise my clinic here, but uh, what, you, what you are getting is evidence-based approaches. So um, I, in the, in the past two years, I made recipes where I think, okay, from a clinical um, judgment perspective, an academic perspective, this makes sense to do, and there is evidence in humans. So um, I will not uh, prescribe uh, things and drugs. I think the evidence is too weak. And I think that's a little bit the difference from, from other uh, clinics uh, there. In terms of diagnostics, we really try to involve everybody who's coming to the clinics also in research that uh, we can say, yes, we, we take the extra blood. You, you get the results of all the omics approaches, which are not yet um, uh, really uh, commonly being used. and. Um, we give that uh, the results back, not from a medical perspective, because 
uh, in, in Singapore, you really have to be careful. I think around the world about regulatory actions, et cetera, and what you, you sell to, to individuals. So it's, it's all evidence-based. If it's not evidence-based, it's based on, on research. And um, there's uh, lots of enthusiasm to, because of that, that safety approach. Okay, thanks. Uh, I think one last question from Leon, also a pretty interesting one. Uh, he, he asked, uh, negative outcomes are more frequent than positive, uh, but they're usually discarded and forgotten. I think taking together negative outcomes could be extremely useful. Do you have a plan to collect uh, uh, the data and report the constructive failures? Yeah, great, great question. Um, being in the field and much more in the translational field and seeing also lots of, um, I don't want to step on anybody's toes, but uh, seeing lots of lab data where you say, okay, I don't know if the experiment really worked. I'm not sure if the mice were really healthy. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. I think what we really need is to be very transparent in what kind of research or what results we have from a human and from an animal, a, a preclinical perspective. I think having something like a database, we don't have to publish every everything, but having respiratory for for data which are which are negative, which somebody else could learn from, would be super important because there is a huge publication bias on on both sides, uh, the preclinical and the clinical side. And I think we are we are really sometimes wasting time and doing experiments again and over and over. And um, another point is let's. Um, power our research well and i think we have to learn also from other specialities our our studies are all too small i think from an animal perspective but but especially also from a human perspective thank you we thank, can you very much. <laughs> thank you very much andrea for this talk and discussion and uh, we move to the next speaker um, who is uh, professor emil van schaftingen Hello. You can already start uh, you with us. Great. Uh, you can start uh, sharing your screen. Uh, he's the director of the Metabolic Research Group at the, the Duve Institute from the Université Catholique de Louvain. hope it, it's pronounced correctly. And um, he will tell us about uh, metabolite repair and aging. Please, you can also uh, share full screen. Yes. Um, I think it's okay. That's fine. You just take the pointer. Um, <laughs> okay, do you see my screen and do you hear me? Yes, we hear you and we see you. Okay, I'm a bit of an outsider here because I'm not working <laughs> directly on aging. I'm working on this subject here, metabolite repair, and I've been working on this for the last uh, 20 years, and I've also worked on some aspects of protein repair. And what I believe is that uh, this something, this, in order to have enjoy healthy um, aging, we need to have healthy molecules. And what I'm going to talk about is uh, something that deals with this problem of keeping our molecules healthy. Um, I think that you would probably agree that. Uh, damage to DNA is a problem, uh, is causing premature aging, but maybe that also damage to proteins and damage to small molecules participate in the aging process. And that's what I want to uh, tell you today and give you some arguments that support that. Nature has been dealing with the problem of damage of biomolecules and for <laughs> billions uh, billions of years and how did it deal with it by by conceiving and putting uh, well installing repair mechanism there are repair mechanisms for dna everybody knows that maybe that people are less familiar with the problem of protein repair there are several protein repair mechanisms that have been established and even less that people are aware of metabolite repair mechanism and uh, nature has also taken care of the fact that it has to minimize the formation of chemically reactive metabolites. People are used to the problem of ROS, but there is more than ROS in the problem of chemically reactive metabolites, and you need to destroy the most reactive ones. 
I will tell you about that today. And I think that this makes that uh, what I'm going to talk about has some relationship, clear relationship with aging. Now, first, uh, metabolite repair, what's the problem? Well, people have overemphasized in textbook of biochemistry the substrate specific of specificity of enzyme by saying that because the enzyme were extremely specific, there was no side reaction to take care about. This is not true. All enzymes have some minor side activities which make them to act slowly on molecules that are present in cells that resemble their substrate. And by doing so, they produce non-classical metabolites. And the problem with these non-classical metabolites is that they will tend to accumulate because they usually are not a substrate. This is the example here. You have a, a normal reaction here with an enzyme that catalyzes this reaction. It will also catalyze slowly this reaction on a molecule that is resembling its substrate, and it will produce a product that is not a substrate for enzyme two and will tend to accumulate unless you have a repair enzyme. We, we started being interested in this problem by studying a disease in which L2-hydroxyglutarate accumulates. L2-hydroxyglutarate is distinct from D2-hydroxyglutarate. I won't talk about D2-hydroxyglutarate. This is a neurological disease. I will say you a few more words uh, about this disease and uh, where you have accumulation of this L2-hydroxyglutarate, which is a non-classical metabolite. What we have done is to identify the enzyme that destroys normally L2-hydroxyglutarate. And uh, it's an enzyme of the mitochondria that catalyzes an irreversible reaction that gives back alpha-ketoglutarate. We have shown that this enzyme is mutated in this disease. And the surprise came uh, when we tried to identify the enzyme that is making L2-hydroxyglutarate. We were thinking it must be a specific enzyme that does that. No, not at all. What we eventually came, to, uh, what we eventually concluded was that this was due, this formation was catalyzed by side activities of well-known enzyme of intermediary metabolism, malate dehydrogenase and lactate dehydrogenase, which had tiny activities to catalyze the reduction of alpha-ketoglutarate onto L2-hydroxyglutarate, reactions that were typically one million times lower than the, react the normal reactions that these enzymes catalyze. Yet, because, uh, okay, what's wrong here? Okay, yet because uh, these enzymes are extremely abundant in cells, uh, we make every day, thanks to them, we make every day grams of L2-hydroxyglutarate and we need this repair enzyme to destroy it un unless uh, uh, it accumulates. If, if we don't have that enzyme, it accumulates and accumulates particularly in our brain where it's, it is causing damage. This just to show you the, the, quickly the phenotype of L2-hydroxyglutarate aciduria it causes mental retardation, neurological symptoms that are becoming progressively more severe with time. So it's a progressive disease. There are frequently brain tumors uh, after a few uh, decennias. And uh, what is maybe interesting in the context of this uh, aging, this meeting on aging is that in some patients, uh, the diagnosis is not made in during infancy, but in old patients and sometimes even up to 70 years of age. And um, this is when there are some mutations that do not completely abolish the activity of L2-hydroxyglutarate dehydrogenase. So here in these patients, there is certainly not healthy aging because of this uh, defect in metabolite repair. Now, is metabolite repair common? I will show you that it is extremely common. But before telling you that, I want to extend a little bit the concept. We need a repair enzyme 
to destroy metabolites that are made by side reaction of enzymes, but we need them also to destroy uh, abnormal metabolites that are made uh, thanks to spontaneous reaction that occur in cells because quite a few of our uh, metabolic intermediates are chemically reactive. And some of them are extremely chemically reactive and we need to destroy them in order to prevent them from, from um, intervening in other reactions and damaging proteins and other metabolites. So when we take everything into account, we, we can make the conclusion that um, metabolite repair and damage pre preemption mechanism are extremely common. I'm showing you here the example of glycolysis, which as you know, is a very well known metabolic pathway with 11 steps. And I'm showing you here the metabolite repair and metabolite damage uh, mechanism that are known presently. I count 11 of them. This is a lot. This is as many as the number of enzymes that there are in glycolysis. And uh, quickly um, here, um, sorry, uh, we have in total for these uh, third, uh, 11 mechanisms, we have eight repair reactions and three preemption mechanisms, a total of 13 enzymes that have been identified and that, have, that are working in these processes and seven diseases due to genetic defects in one or the other of these enzymes are known presently. And I'm showing them here to you, um, uh, at least mo most of them. And of course, some of them are not involved at all in any process of aging, but they are nonetheless interesting. Uh, for instance, neutropenias <laughs> in two uh, rare inborn errors of metabolism are due to a problem of um, metabolite repair defect. And because we, we, we have been able to identify that. We have been able to propose a treatment for these neutropenias, which is very successful and which is now applied worldwide in more than 100 patients. 100 patient is a big figure when you're considering that these are extra rare diseases. We had just before uh, in the presentation of the previous uh, speakers, a word about the importance of nicotinamide. These two enzymes, NADH dehydratase and NADH epimerase, are catalyzing the maintenance of NADH and NADPH, which can get sometimes hydrated and become something that is no longer used by dehydrogenases. We have two enzymes to destroy that, Two enzyme defects have been, the two enzyme defects have been described. This has nothing to do with aging. Uh, this leads to diseases that are mostly fatal before two years of age. Now, if I'm now restricting myself to uh, the, the, the problems of uh, metabolite maintenance uh, that are potentially related with aging, I can see four of them. I have already mentioned L2-hydroxyglutaric aciduria. I will now talk about a, a, a special form of Parkinson's disease and of uh, two other genes that are potentially uh, involved in uh, aging. Now, Parkinson's disease, as you know, is an age-related disease. In some cases, it has a clear genetic origin. There are dominant forms, there are recessive forms. And I will just talk about this form here, which is due to mutation in a protein called PARC7 or DJ1. This protein has been extremely studied because it's a very interesting, uh, there are more than 1000 papers on this, on this protein. And it's, it's very important indeed to identify the function of this protein. But until recently, there was no uh, real consensus on what this protein was doing, because uh, if you would knock out the protein, uh, you would find uh, results that do, did not confirm uh, the previous hypothesis. This has changed now, thanks to the work of Guido Bomber, one of my colleagues, uh, well, heading a separate group at the Duduv Institute in Brussels, what Guido has found is that this protein is something 
that is an enzyme that serves to destroy a metabolite that hadn't been identified until then. And this metabolite, it's not truly a metabolite, it's a side product made from a conventional uh, metabolite of glycolysis known as 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate spontaneously uh, gets uh, degraded to cyclic 1,3-monophosphoglycerate, which is an extremely potent reagent for amino group, which will react with amino groups of proteins and of metabolites extremely quickly in a matter of seconds. And what PARC7 does is to destroy this metabolite. And because you need to have this metabolite extremely quickly broken down, you need to have a high concentration of PARC7 because you don't want that in the course of, uh, you, you, it, uh, you don't want to, that the diffusion limits the destruction of this metabolite by PARC7. So I think that uh, this is really indicating that um, PARC7 is an anti-aging enzyme to the extent that you admit that Parkinson's disease is a uh, disease of uh, uh, oldening, of, uh, of aging. No, I'm not talking about the last two examples, uh, PGP and FN3K and FN3KRP, because we were quite surprised to, to, to see this paper appearing a couple of years ago, uh, a very interesting paper uh, based on a study of uh, a number of German centenarians and long-lived uh, uh, individuals th that were compared uh, with um, controls less than 60 years of age. And this is an exome-wide association study. And two genes were named in the title of this, um, of this paper. And this was amazing to us because these are two proteins that we were the first to, to describe the function. Now, um, I'm, I'm telling you, you now the function of these proteins. The first one is called PGP. That's not the best name. It has been named like that. Uh, 20 years ago when it was sequenced for the first time. But what this protein does is to destroy two extremely um, damaging molecules that are called 4-phosphoenritronate and 2-phospholactate. And one of them is formed as a side activity of the central glycolytic enzyme GAPDH. And it is very embarrassing to have this molecule because it is a... Uh, transition state analog of the enzyme catalyzing the conversion of 6-phosphogluconate to ribulose 5-phosphate in the pentose phosphate pathway. And it is an extremely strong inhibitor. You need to destroy this inhibitor. You need to destroy also 2-phospholactate, which is made by a side activity of pyruvate kinase because it inhibits the enzyme that is making the powerful regulator of glycolysis, fructose 2, 6 bisphosphate. You won't be surprised that the PGP knockout mutation is embryonic lethal in mice. Because when you knock out in cells, this, this enzyme here, PGP, you see an increase in 4 phosphate retronate by 100 fold, and the same for the concentration of 6 phosphogliconate. This is not a 30% increase, 100 fold increase. Now, um, Centenarians have probably higher PGP activity, this is not known, or wider tissue distribution of this enzyme. This is how I can potentially explain the link between PGP and uh, the, the old age of these people. And uh, I'm not talking about the other gene that had been identified, um, and which is FN3KRP. FN3KRP is for fructosamine tree kinase related protein. These two genes encoding FN3K and FN3KRP are sitting next, next to each other in the genome. And I'm not sure that in the study that has been published, uh, the investigators could really uh, ascribe the linkage to FN3KRP rather than to FN3K. I think that both of them are linked. Now, I tell you what this enzyme is doing. Well, you may know 
that glucose reacts with amino groups of proteins and also of micromolecules. And that after a, a so-called Amado rearrangement, this gives rise to a fructosamine. What we have discovered more than 20 years ago is that there is an enzyme, fructosamine tree kinase, that serves to phosphorylate the third carbon of the fructosamine moiety of this, uh, of this, of this molecule. And that this destabilizes uh, the fructosamine and makes it to detach from the protein and or from the micromolecule and which is then released in, in free form. Now, FN3KRP compared to FN3K works on derivatives of ribose. That's one thing. And the other thing that I wanted to say is that there is a highly variable FN3K activity in human erythrocytes. Uh, it, this is very unusual. You have a fourfold range of activity if you are measuring the activity in different persons, and this high activity is stable with age. So it's uh, linked to SNPs that are present in the FN3K and the FN3KRP genes. Now, I'm showing you here the, the results of the study that I was mentioning before. You see here that the linkage is uh, the most um, uh, significant uh, SNPs are present uh, there just where the FN3KRP and the FN3K gene are. And so I believe that centenarians, they actually have a higher expression of FN3KRP. This has been said by uh, in this paper, but they, got, they must have higher FN3K and FN3KRP activities that enable them to destroy more efficiently glycation products. And I'm arriving to my conclusion Defects in metabolite repair or damage control may, I think, in some cases, promote aging and maybe that they may promote non-healthy aging. Uh, this indicates that damage of small molecules and proteins participate in uh, aging. We need to further identify metabolite and protein repair uh, mechanism, but this is a difficult job because we are searching things that are unknown and that in some cases are present in small amounts and that the enzymes that serve to deal with them are working at very low activities. And with this, I thank you for your attention and I thank also all the people with whom I've been working uh, during uh, the last years. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Emil. Uh, I think we have just uh, time for one question. Uh, we are running a bit out of time. So uh, the question is from Leon. Uh, how conserved are the enzymes and metabolic cascades you discussed across species? Would you expect them to play similar roles in uh, cold-blooded species with similar uh, overall aging statistics? The, the, the enzymes that serve to repair NADHX are present in all species, archaea, your bacteria, all vertebrates, all uh, multicellular organisms. That's one. And this is for many of the other enzymes. Part seven is conserved in yeast, is conserved in bacteria, is conserved in uh, drosophila. And uh, for those, Guido Bomer has shown that it plays the same role in these different organisms I just mentioned. So many of these repair proteins are extremely conserved. Uh, so uh, we are talking about a general phenomenon. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, explanation of this talk. And uh, our last speaker is uh, uh, Professor Joao Pedro de Maguilares. Uh, who is with the Genomics of Aging and Rejuvenation Lab, Institute of Inflammation and Aging, University of Birmingham. If it's out of date, please correct me. And, um, and uh, he will speak about prospects, problems, and pitfalls in developing aging therapeutics. So, John, Thank please. you. Yes, hi. Thank you, Ilya. Thank you, Didier. So let me scare, share my screen. Um, so... Okay, so can you hear me? Can you see the slides? Uh, yes, we hear you, we see you, so good. 
Okay, oops. So yeah, so thank you. So I'll, I'll start with a brief introduction and then I will, um, uh, I, I, I suppose, provide a, an overview of some of the advances in particularly at the level of pharmacological interventions in aging, but also some of the problems, some, some, some issues we have, some difficult issues we have in my opinion, uh, and also briefly some of the work we've, we've been doing. So, so let me, um, brief introduction, I think quite a few of you know me already, but just so those who don't, um, I mean, I, I work on aging essentially um, because when I was a child, I, I figured that we have to overcome aging. I, 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 it's, um, it's really um, the major cause of death in modern societies. And so, so I decided back when I was a child, there's a photo of me as a child, that I wanted to cure aging and that's what I would spend my career doing. So, so that's, I'm not saying that's, that's easy or even it's possible within a foreseeable future, but that's, that's the ultimate goal. That's what I, you know, what, what I do my work is with that goal in mind. And that's important for some of the issues or some of the discussion I'll mention in a few minutes. Um, so, so, so with that in mind, um, as Ilya mentioned, I've recently moved to the University of Birmingham. So I'm now based in, I was in Liverpool for quite a long time and now I'm at the University of Birmingham, Institute of Inflammation and Aging. Um, and so, so our lab in Birmingham, we do quite a few things that I don't have time to go into detail on any, everything, but uh, we do various computational genomic approaches. We do evolutionary analysis. We have some focuses on cell models, animal, well, long-lived models. Um, but most of what I'll focus today will be more on at the level of uh, uh, in interventions, in particular pharmacological interventions in aging. And that's what uh, mostly I'll talk about and, and also some of the computational methods we've been working on. So, so in this context, as I'm sure you're aware, there's been a lot of excitement in the field. There's been a lot of advances. I mean, this is from, um, uh, from, from a paper uh, I did last year on the number of drugs associated with longevity in model systems. And as you can see, there's this huge exponential growth in longevity drugs. Um, so it's quite remarkable. I mean, the field is exploding. There's lots of lots of uh, longevity drugs. It is quite an exciting time to work on longevity pharmacology. So uh, one of the things we've developed, and I mentioned this uh, uh, you know, previously in this, in this conference, is the, it's called the Drug Edge Database of Age-Related Drugs. So this is a compilation of uh, uh, hundreds of studies um, uh, from manipulations of longevity in model systems uh, using drugs or compounds. And uh, the current version um, has over 1,000 drugs or compounds that increase lifespan in at least one model system. So again, it's quite remarkable how much we are advancing in the field in the context of longevity manipulations uh, using pharmaco pharmacological methods. So having said it, I mean, when you look, when you dig a deep, deep deeper into, into the data, uh, one of the things we did, uh, we published earlier this year with Alex Moskalev and others, was when you look at the most studied drugs, uh, across model systems, which is these drugs here, so you, you see actually quite a, a, a very large spread in terms of longevity effects and differences between drugs. So let me show you a couple of examples. So what you see here are the, the major longevity drugs uh, in terms of number of studies we have in drug age. Um, and this is the average lifespan change across, mm -hmm. so sort of a meta-analysis of the different uh, studies for each of those drugs. So when you look, for example, at resveratrol, there are studies that show an increase in lifespan in resveratrol, but there's some that show a decrease in. And, and actually, the average is very close to zero uh, when you take into consideration all of the studies. Uh, by contrast, rapamycin, um, you do see that the average, or, or when you do this meta-analysis type, is that there is an, an increase uh, in lifespan when you take all of these results combined. So, so the point is that there's a lot of studies. Some of them are positive, some of them are negative. Um, and uh, it's important to take into consideration these differences between uh, different studies. Uh, and for some compounds, that doesn't appear to be a strong effect, like resveratrol. For others, like rapamycin, there seems to be a significant impact on longevity. Now, there's something else I wanted to point out here as well, which is when you look at the effect sizes, so when you look at the lifespan effects, they're not very big. Uh, we're talking 10, 5, 10% increase in lifespan. 
Um, I mean, even rapamycin, I think, well, it depends on whether males or females, but it, it's about 10, 15% maximum in rodents. Uh, and this is data from across systems. So when you look in rodents, mice in particular, you don't see very big effects in terms of longevity. Um, for example, by comparison, caloric restriction, you see about, uh, well, depends on strains, but it's about up to 50% increase in lifespan that you observed in at least some, some rodent strains. Uh, and that is still, the, that was discovered decades ago, and that is still the most we can extend lifespan in rodents, uh, lifespan in mammals. Um, so it's still caloric restriction. So, so pharmacological interventions have relatively modest effect sizes, which I actually think it raises uh, an important question, which is whether these longevity drugs are actually delaying aging. Now, it's very possible, I would say many of them may be improving health via aging independent mechanisms. Um, for example, to use rodents as a, as, an, as a case, mice mostly die of, of cancer. So if you have a drug that reduces cancer in mice, then it's going to extend lifespan, even, it does, even if it doesn't do anything else about any other aging phenotype. So, so that's something that I, I think it's quite a, um, or could be an issue for a lot of these longevity interventions. Maybe they impact on longevity, but they're not acting via aging mechanisms. They're acting via... Um, aging independent mechanisms by specific diseases rather than retarding the whole aging process, which is what I would like, at least. And, I mean, I'm not saying that research on cancer is not important. Of course it is. But if we want to intervene in aging, we want interventions that impact on aging and not just on cancer. So, so that's, that's the argument. Um, and then when you look at uh, the, the, the specific mechanisms targeted by most drugs, actually there, there's a relatively small number of pathways and processes being targeted. So again, I published this last year, but you know we're talking a lot of drugs target oxidative stress and mitochondria. Um, we've heard about it in this conference already. A lot of drugs target senescent cells, a lot of senolytics, uh, and quite a few drugs uh, or compounds are mediators of or trying to mimic caloric restriction um, like via mTOR, NAT+, etc. So there's a, a relatively narrow focus of, of anti-aging biotech. I think there's a lot of folks try going for the low-hanging fruit, um, but I, I, I would like to see a greater diversity in approaches uh, in the industry. Um, that, that, that's the point. And I, I think with that in mind, I think the other issue, I suppose, is that when you look at what we know about aging and what we don't know, the current mechanisms of aging, they could be wrong. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of emphasis um, I'm sure you're aware on the hallmarks of aging. Uh, we've heard about it in this conference. Um, but the fact is, we don't know if they're right. I mean, they're, they're, they could turn out to be wrong. We don't know if senescent cells are a driver of aging in any human tissue. There, there is simply no evidence for that. Uh, we don't know if telomere shortening is a driver of aging in any human tissue. Um, I, I think there is still a lot of unknowns in terms of what are the underlying causes of aging. So, so although there's a number of hypotheses, we don't know for sure why human beings age. So, so that is another, I think, limitation we have in a field and another challenge is that we, we still don't understand the human aging process. Uh, and so perhaps not surprisingly, I mean, there's a lot of challenges, I suppose, going from model systems and preclinical models to humans. I'm sure you're aware of, of the difficulties, not just in aging research, but in, in big pharma, in, in, in biomedical discovery in general, in growing from animal models to human clinical applications. Part of this is because of this gap in knowledge as well regarding human biology. Again, we don't understand why, why human beings age. That, that still remains a very uh, timely uh, and very big open question in the field. And as has been mentioned before as well in, in this conference, there's a lot of let's say limitations and, and challenges um, in clinical trials. They take several years, they cost a lot of money. Um, and when you're talking about aging uh, as a phenotype, um, there's very long validation times. So, so one of the issues we have in aging is, of course, we can only, uh, not just in aging, but particularly in aging, but a, a bottleneck in biomedical research is clinical trials are very long and expensive. And so we can only test a, a limited number of therapies for a limited number of uh, conditions. So, so, those, so those are important limitations that are not easy to overcome, even with, with lots of funding, for instance. It doesn't matter how much money you have, a clinical trial uh, is going to take a certain amount of time. So, so there, that's, that's a very important bottleneck we have um, in research. 
uh, in particularly in, in a research like aging that, that takes quite a long time to develop. So, so with that in mind, I mean, we've, um, in the last few minutes, I'll just briefly touch upon some of the, the, the work we've been uh, developing and um, I, I wouldn't say overcome, that would be, I think, over optimistic, but uh, trying to address or trying to help in this bottlenecks. So one thing uh, um, that we've done quite a lot is in terms of uh, developing data-driven computational uh, approaches and methods um, to prioritize gene targets, to prioritize genes, and to prioritize drugs, which is, well, we've done a lot on genetics as well, which I won't talk about today, but we've done a lot in terms of using data-driven approaches to prioritize drugs um, for impact on aging. Um, so, so we have a, been developing a number of computational methods, which I'll briefly uh, summarize. The goal is to reduce the number of experiments. So as I said, I mean, even in animal models, the time it takes to do an experiment uh, is not something you can overcome with money, for example. Even if you're the best funded company in the world, doesn't matter. It's still, if you want to do a lifespan experiment in normal mice, it will still take about four years. And, and there's nothing you can change about that. So, so the goal is to try to prioritize drugs uh, or, or candidates um, to reduce the number of experiments. So one thing, so I'll briefly show a couple of um, a couple of uh, uh, papers and a preprint we've actually just posted a couple of days ago um, without going to a lot of details. Um, but so this is now on BioArchive. So we've just um, posted this uh, method for predicting longevity drugs using machine learning. So the way it works very briefly is we take drugs from drug age, um, but then we look at their uh, gene targets. And then from those gene targets, we look at which of those are aging related genes, uh, which processes they're associated using gene ontology, which phenotypes they're associated with, which other proteins they interact with. Uh, and then we use those features to define the, the ones that are most associated with longevity. Uh, and then based on those features, we try to predict new drugs in terms of associated or candidates for associations with longevity. Um, so it's a, it's a machine learning method that we, we've just released. So um, for more details, please check out our, our preprint in BioArchive. Now, the other thing we've, we've actually started a few years back already. So, so again, I'll skip on the details, um, but we developed this, this network pharmacology um, method for um, repositioning, for drug repositioning in the context of longevity. I mean, very briefly, we've published this before, but um, very briefly, we look at um, gene expression signatures of longevity, specific caloric restriction, and then we try to identify drugs um, that induce similar or statistically uh, overlapping um, signatures to longevity. Uh, and then we found a number of drugs, five of them we tested in C. elegans, four of which extended lifespan. So, I mean, we published this in Aging Cell in 2016. Um, the most interesting, or at least the most novel of those drugs was Alantuin. Now, Alantuin is, is actually a marker of oxidative stress, um, and it's used in anti-aging skin creams. Um, uh, but we were the first to show it extends longevity uh, and health span as well in worms. So, so we were interested. Okay, so how can we uh, take this further? Now, Alantuin, for various reasons, has that, well, in terms of bioavailability in humans, there's some issues in mammals even. Uh, and so we decided to focus on another um, compound called rilmanidine. And, and so very briefly, I'll tell you what we've been doing. So again, it's not been published, but it's a it's a preprint on bioarchive. So rilmanidine is used as an oral antihypertensive drug. So it has relatively um, uh, rare and non-severe side effects. So it's already used in the clinic, um, but we tested it in C. elegans as well. So we showed extends lifespan. Um, so what you see here is a survival of animals, um, at different dosages. So about 200 micromolar was, was the optimal um, and it extends lifespan whether you feed animals in early in life or in late in life, uh, which of course is what you want if you want to apply it to older uh, individuals. Um, we did various mechanistic studies, which I, I won't mention, mention here. We, we found the receptor we think is involved. We created a mutant. I'm, I'm not gonna go into that, but it's in the preprint. The, the point is that rilmanidin is a potential new, quite interesting and promising longevity drug, given that it's already used in the clinic. 
it's, uh, I mean, together with, uh, this was done with various collaborators like Colin Hewell in, in Zurich and Vadim Gladyshev in Boston. Um, and uh, so we showed that the transcriptional changes in mice uh, fed romanidin are similar to other life extending uh, interventions like caloric restriction. Um, and there's already uh, data from other labs on rilmanidin in mouse models of the neurodegenerative diseases. Um, so there's already some evidence for well, promise, for clinical promise from mouse models. So I would argue it's a, it's a promising new, new geroprotector. I mean, of course, I take it with a grain of salt. All we've done so far is in worms. There's a big gap from worms to, to even to mammalian models and big gap from mammalian models to humans. Um, but our goal now is uh, uh, is to, to take this to um, rodent models or mammalian models uh, and explore if this could be uh, a potential new anti-aging um, therapeutic. So, so that's, that's something that we're quite interested in exploring in the future. Um, and so with that, um, I'll just um, uh, summarize. So I've told you that we now know from um, and it's cataloged in our drug age database over a thousand um, drugs and compounds that can modulate longevity in model systems. Having said that, there's a lot of variation between them. Um, I, I think a big question to me is whether these longevity drugs, whether they delay aging or whether they're affecting aging independent mechanisms. To me, that's that's a big question. I think, well, as I said, you know, if, if you want to develop a, long, a drug to anti-cancer, that's fantastic. But what I think would have a bigger impact, of course, and my interest is really in delaying aging. So, so, and I, I'm, I have my doubts whether most of these longevity drugs are actually delaying aging. Um, I told you as well that, that we have a lot of bottlenecks in the field, like long validation times, lack of mechanistic understanding of aging. Um, so there's still a, a number of problems. Um, but on the bright side, I've mentioned some of the in silico computational methods we've been developing, uh, trying to, to predict and prioritize uh, compounds um, in the context of aging and longevity. Uh, and lastly, I have to mention this uh, new potential geroprotector. It is a geroprotector in worms, we can say that, um, called remanidin, which is already used in a clinic to, uh, sorry, to treat uh, hypertension and would have um, potential uh, for, for further discoveries. So thank you very much. I mean, this is actually my 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 lab is uh, and my office is in the hospital. This is Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham. Uh, if you're if you're nearby, feel free to drop me a line for a visit. And and um, I should also mention that we are recruiting um, PhD students. Uh, we'll have a postdoc position advertised uh, probably next week. So if any of this is of interest, please feel free to drop me an email. And uh, well, if we, if we have time for questions, happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pedro. Yes, we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, so um, uh, I know, uh, Eduard, do you want to ask yourself directly in your own voice? Uh, OK, so hello. Uh, so as understanding aging is complex, and therefore predictions are very uncertain, wouldn't it mostly make sense to massively test in parallel many of the promising things that you described in Daphnia and in mice, for example? So, I mean, absolutely. I think, you know, I'm all in favor of doing large scale testing. Um, uh, I, I suppose the big bottleneck is just costing, you know, it's, it's, um, we have been involved somewhat in, um, in the ITP program, the interventions testing program of the NIA. We had, well, we had a, a fish oil actually accepted into it. Um, and it's a fantastic program, but it is quite expensive. We're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars per compound being tested. Um, so, so there's only a certain number of compounds that can be tested. So I, I suppose that's the big bottleneck is, is, um, is having the funds to do this parallel experiments, as you say. But I mean, from a <laughs> biological perspective, I'm all for it. Because for aging, as you know, in the 2000s, uh, this was done in C. elegans uh, with uh, RNA uh, screenings. Um, and uh, this is how we identified axis of longevity in C. elegans and how after looking a bit around what worked, we made them live 50%, uh, then twice, then 10 times, then 30 times longer. And I think this is the missing approach uh, for uh, uh, based on the knowledge we have today, 
of course, there are many other ways if you can understand, that's fine. But I think this has changed it to work. So, and yeah, and uh, maybe I will say last thing, uh, just a side remark. Each time I hear that uh, mice uh, I can't live more than, let's say, 30%. I remember the work by Bartke and Drew, uh, where he used the uh, Ames dwarf mice uh, and added the uh, cardiac restriction. And I think he reached a 70% uh, life extension. I know that it's not uh, at all what we look for because it's uh, it doesn't work. That's the work from uh, Holly Brown, I think. Um, uh, when it started, it started with a mutation later in age, it doesn't work as well. But the biggest life extension I am know of is seventy percent. Yes. Okay. Well, I think, but I think that's just very briefly. I mean, I think that's a good um, good point. But then that's, I think. That is the the I, I suppose the difference between you know doing caloric restriction or genetic manipulations where you see a lot uh, or, or you in some cases you greater lifespan extension than in pharmacological approaches. We um, you know that that's the amounts of the effect sizes we see with compounds and drugs is still much smaller. That's that's I, I think that's the problem because that's the way for human translation. Thank you, thank you. Okay, Aubrey, you wanted to also comment and uh, ask a question? Sure, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I was just being a, a bit of a nuisance in my comment, but my question is, um, uh, would you agree that if a, an intervention extends maximum lifespan in mice, for example, then it is much, much more likely to be affecting aging than if it only extends mean lifespan? So that's a that's a very good question. We've done a bit of work on that actually. We published an article in in genetics, not on pharmacological interventions, but genetic m manipulations of aging, and looking at demographic aging rates, average lifespan, maximum lifespan. I would say yes, it's more likely if it extends lifespan, but it's not a given. So just because an intervention extends maximum lifespan, particularly if the effect sizes are small, I wouldn't say by itself it proves that it's retarding aging. Um, uh, to me, the effect sizes are quite important, I, I would say. So, so yes, I, I would agree, uh, but not uh, <laughs> to some degree, I would agree, but I wouldn't say that's, uh, you know, yes or no. I think that there's a bit of a gray area there as well. Thank you. Uh, uh, one more question from uh, Ole Lufchak. Uh, is it possible to predict additive or synergistic effects of anti-aging drugs with AI? <laughs> Yes, but it's not 100% accurate. So, so for example, when we, we, you know, we do our machine learning approaches, for example, um, it can help. I mean, we can have, we have predictive models that are better than just random, but they're not 100% accurate. I, I suppose that's one of the problems of biology. And it, it's really, really complicated. And it is really, really difficult to make very accurate predictive models. So yes, you can build predictive models with AI and machine learning uh, for for longevity effects or for even other phenotypes, um, in a lot of cases they're better than just random predictions, but they're not hundred percent accurate. So you still need to go and do some experiments and prove that we are you're predicting is actually is actually true. Okay, thank you. I think uh, we'll have uh, one last question and then maybe a couple more minutes for the general round. Or, or uh, we'll stop there. From uh, from uh, Voda, from uh, Alexander and Voda, you want to ask yourself, but very briefly, Alexandru. Um, hi, yeah. So, um, really cool presentation. Just wanted to ask whether, firstly, whether there's um, any supplemental figure with the ninety five percent confidence intervals on the Kaplan Mayer curves for the new drug, and then the second thing is if you can give any bits of detail about the post op position. So in terms of the first question, so yes, um, there's in the preprint for Realmanadin, there's uh, Excel spreadsheet with all of the lifespan curves. And so we did various lifespan experiments, not just one. We actually ended up doing nearly a hundred lifespan experiments in, in total when you count like, because we could generated a mutant and then we tested Realmanadin, we were up a mycin. So um, we actually ended up doing a lot of lifespan experiments and all of that should be in the supplementary material in an Excel spreadsheet. And sorry, I forgot your second question. What was the second question? <laughs> 
about the post about the post position if you have any details now or if it's a project in drafting right now so so it's a project uh, to work on actually machine learning uh, developing machine learning methods for predicting longevity drugs so it's uh, mostly computational but the project also involves uh, validation experimental validation of the drugs um so so if you're interested feel free to i mean you or anyone if you're interested feel free to to drop me an email happy to to discuss further thank you thank you very much for the great talk for raising some of the tough thank questions you. that will need to deal a lot for the foreseeable time and uh, you know uh, we we plan to generally a, a round of uh, of uh, questions uh, i think we can forego because uh, we had plenty of opportunity to ask uh, so maybe i don't know uh, maybe patricio if you want to ask uh, some urgent question that, that that you forgot to joe pedro to anybody um, not urgent just a comment okay. uh, i i think it's very interesting what you said about the um, <clears throat> anti hypertensive drug uh, because uh, in 2004, Nobel Prize Linda Bax published a PNS article about um, serotonin analog that was able to enhance 30% um, lifespan in C. elegans. So I think this kind of experiments have been done all over in the decades. There is a relationship between um, mood tension in the body and longevity. This is something physically, it belongs to the structure of our body. I mean, we are also not only genes, but tensions. And I think this is an interesting uh, avenue to um, continue to look for comment. Thank you. Yes, Thank you. you. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, so I guess uh, we should be finishing. We already I think we're 20 minutes past our our schedule, but uh, fortunately uh, there's some person canceled, so we're still okay. Uh, so right now uh, uh, we'll have 10 more minutes break. Um, and uh, thank you very much for the amazing uh, discussion, uh, for the amazing presentations. Uh, really proud to to be here and uh, really happy to uh, to continue with Didier in 10 minutes thanks do you want to allow people to talk in the break sort of like in real conference uh you want to talk yeah sure why not talk no i, I if people want to mingle and sure uh, do you have, have breakout rooms or something like that we don't have breakout rooms so if you want to talk here but uh, remember that it's streamed live so please don't say anything that that will be used against you um, uh, with whoever is interested, I'm curious to discuss uh, this last um, uh, machine learning generalization of drugs. Um, so uh, I think machine learning in general is very vulnerable to mislabeled instances. Um, so uh, I imagine that uh, drug age being um, you know, excellent project in itself and machine learning generalization being a good idea in itself, uh, it would be uh, essentially rendered dysfunctional if uh, their papers, which just have um, bad science, uh, some, you know, some papers which would uh, claim that rapamycin has no effect at all, or some paper which would um, present drugs with strong effect, which don't. Those are sort of mislabeled instances, which, uh, yeah, I expect to be very harmful to pretty much any machine learning uh, algorithms. Um, I wonder if people have thoughts about that. So, I mean, I can briefly comment on that. Um, I, I suppose the issue with with machine learning and our databases and this kind of approaches is, you know, you, you're right. The quality of the underlying data will determine uh, the quality of the of the results and the predictions um, you obtain. Um, so, you know, if there's poor quality data, then then obviously that has an impact. Having said that, the more data you have, 
you know, the more diluted any idiosyncrasies and any errors become, unless they're systematic errors. Um, so, so, you know, if there's some, you know, failed experiment, if there's some fabricated result, if there's some missing data set, or if there's some error, even from us, sometimes we, you know, we, we put the wrong number there. Um, you know, if you have over a thousand data points that kind of gets diluted, then um, having said that, uh, we, we only, I, I'm perfectly aware of um, limitations in the way researchers, you know, do, do this kind of experiments. Uh, and so that, that's, but that's not something that is possible to, um, to overcome in a systematic way. And, and you are right, there are going to be biases in the database. Um, um, that, Don't you that, feel that some sort of uh, um, crowdsourced effort of curation um, would lead to a much better performance of um, machine learning methods? So that's an interesting question. We have tried crowdfunding, um, you know, contributions, basically community contributions to our databases. We had it. Uh, we had an option for people to contribute to our databases. And the option was there for a couple of years and very, very few people contributed. Um, in the vast majority of cases, contributions were people just posting their paper that they've just published. Hey, you know, I published this paper. Here's the data we obtain. Here we go. Put it in your database. Um, so we got very, very few contributions. Um, so we tried it and it didn't but, really work. Um, but I, I think this could be very good if you enforce some sort of a data submission format. Yes, people want to promote their papers, but if they are forced to submit their data in a kind of a high quality standardized way, that could actually uh, help a lot. Um, we, we had a little Excel spreadsheet uh, to make it standard for people to make data submissions. And, 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 and yeah, so, so folks, some folks did submit, as I said, by and large people submitting data from their own papers. Um, so, so, I mean, there are some, you know, we have collaborators in Israel, for instance, in Romania for quite a long time that we've been working on our databases and they've been fantastic. So we've had colleagues that have been contributing to our databases. Um, so, so there has been some some very important contributors. I wouldn't call that as a crowdfunding initiative. It's it's, okay. it's a relatively small group of crowd of crowdsourced. Yes, right. it's not so much no, crowdsourced. Another possibility that I see specific to machine learning effort is that with machine learning, uh, you can uh, do some sort of cross validation and identify uh, outliers. Right. So you you would identify. Um, purely based on your machine learning models that certain data are real outliers do not you know it does not agree with the rest of the data set so you could prioritize that way which papers need to be reread for fine print and uh, those data points probably thrown out of the training data and models rebuild and you can kind of loop I like that I think they sort of do that. I think they have some sort of heterogeneity testing in their, you know, like overview of the databases. Because if you look at the plot from Joao Pedro's um, talk, they didn't just plot the mean life expansion from a drug. They plotted a variance around it, like a box plot, right? So they're looking at multiple studies. So in some way, a box plot, you know, has the 75th um, inter, you know, like quantile ranges, but it also has like outlier. Oh, map so you can have you can have like a single dot if like a, a study is like really outside of the range of all the others so in some in some way this is like happening like if 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 they didn't do that i think most peer reviewers wouldn't accept their paper to begin with because it's like um like so so yeah so you're right we we do that to some degree already i would say the challenge so Yes, we do that. We actually have automated cross checks in the database. So, for example, if you see, I don't know, a mouse living twenty years, you know, it it will flag it, right? So, so there are um, cross checks already in place for obvious outliers, obvious errors. So that exists already. I, I suppose it depends, you know, on the level of granularity that you go. If you start to go to dig very deep, I think there are things that look a little fishy. But then the problem is we have thousands of records now, <laughs> it's over a thousand compounds. 
And I mean, you know, we, we simply don't have the time to check every single one of them. So we tend to prioritize. So um, we actually notice, well, we, we, we're doing some minor adjustments to, for example, data in mice. So, so that's, you know, if I have to make a decision of where to prioritize, I tend to prioritize mammalian models over invertebrate models. It's, I just think they're potentially more relevant to humans. So that's what I tend to do. Okay. So that's something we've, um, we're actually looking into making some adjustments. Could there be some errors in the data for C. elegans? Probably, um, but there's so many records, it's, it's impossible to go through them one by one. But I mean, again, if okay. anyone is interested in collaborating, then, then <laughs> please let me know. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, dear Joe Pedro, first of all, thank you for this great presentation. I just wanted to say yeah. that in addition to... So, oh, it... Sorry, Daria. Oh. I, uh, I, it... I leave you... I give you okay. 60 seconds, but not more. Okay. 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 So the point is that in some clinical trials or cohort studies, there are effects of humans of reducing all cause mortality. And we collected this uh, studies in the table and in the paper, which I posted in the chat. Maybe it would be also helpful. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, Thank I'll have you. a look. Thank you very much uh, uh, for this uh, break. That was uh, a really a very interesting break. Uh, and this first session was also really great. But now uh, we are already ahead of time. So we have to uh, begin with the second session. And for the second session, the first person to speak uh, will be Reginald de Schepper medical anthropologist attached to the mental health and well-being research group at the VUB Breil University at Brussels in Belgium. So, Reginald, the floor is yours. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for inviting me for this uh, interesting conference. And I will talk uh, this evening about uh, a new kind of protocol I propose. It's uh, called uh, Every Year Younger Protocol. And also, uh, it's about uh, the challenging balance between biohacking and uh, evidence based science. And so, why I propose this? Well, of course, you know, there's an enormous progress in the field of longevity science. You know, the hallmarks of aging know the mechanisms and there are now a lot of interventions available. There are also some studies based on uh, humans uh, to turn back epigenetics clocks, but most of always these studies are ending with, with the phrase uh, more research as needed. And on the other hand, you have a medical practice. Uh, it has some important principles, first of all, do not harm, which is of course an important ethical principle, but it might slow down implementation of new knowledge. And as you know, as we heard from the former uh, presenter, uh, evidence base takes a lot of minutes, uh, a lot of time. So what is the problem? First of all, there's good news. There's an exponential growth in studies and, and progress of science and technology in the field of longevity science. For instance, um, uh, the field of omics and artificial intelligence. Um, so the progress in biology is uh, now comparable, I think, to what, what uh, happened um, 30 years ago uh, in ICT with ICT. But the bad news is, that it takes so much time to uh, put uh, new insights into practice. For instance, if you uh, have a case study, then you need pilot study. Finally, you end with uh, implementation, but that might take uh, 20 years. So the question is, is there a shortcut? And maybe biohacking, but what is biohacking? Well, it's, it has several definitions, but one is the optimization and adaptation of nature using biology and technology. So 
It's about taking control over biological processes. Um, tricking the body by generating signals, signals that may improve our health. There are several examples, like, for instance, the fast mimicking <clears throat> diet of Walter Longo um, leads to autophagy. Heat and cold exposure uh, may activate longevity mechanisms and vaccination is also an example that triggers uh, immunity. But it's also some kind of do-it-yourself science. There is re less regulation, it's science-based, but open to everybody, what is a good thing, I think. And it can be used as a shortcut in science to quickly make use of the latest know knowledge. So there is no strict definition of biohacking, no strict demarcation between evidence-based medicine and biohacking. And there is a gray zone. Uh, it includes sometimes pseudoscience and unethical practices. And why is it now a good time? Because there is an exponential growth of knowledge. Uh, we have uh, almost 2 million of papers published in 28,000 journals. It doubles every nine years. And to give you one example, uh, there are now more than 500,000 papers on obesity and more than 100 publications each day. So not even uh, an expert can follow this field. Uh, also, it's now these data, this uh, uh, body of knowledge is now accept, accessible to almost everyone. So everyone can go to PubMed and, and look up for these things. Um, also, there is, we have now opportunity for self-measurement. And there are also some do-it-yourself interventions, not always uh, very good things uh, or uh, not that I would uh, propose to do this. For example, one uh, very uh, um, striking example is a gene editing kit. And I looked it up. Uh, you can buy it now uh, for 160 nine dollars it's a kit that you can use to um, for back to your gene editing but uh, biohacking is also a kind of patient empowerment and there are several examples of biohackers you probably know joshua Jainer, uh, but there are also people who do not call themselves necessarily biohackers but that these are people, for instance, with uh, serious diseases who, instead of waiting un until there was a protocol to, to uh, cure themselves, they went to the uh, medical literature and they found out how they could, uh, what, what to do to cure themselves. And uh, th there are several good examples of that. So, uh, there is a, an intersection between uh, biomedical science and biohacking. Uh, and it has pros and cons. And I think um, there um, is situation. Also, uh, my protocol I want to propose, uh, it's called the El Kaya protocol. And we have to weigh the pros and balances. So. There is a risk of uh, doing things that are not fully um, evidence-based, but there is also a risk of not taking action. And uh, an example of that, uh, there was a few years ago, a study who said, uh, who concluded that uh, aspirin may help treat aggressive cancer, but it's too early to recommending people start taking it. More research is needed. But what if you have uh, an aggressive cancer? If you wait, uh, then, then you will be dead. And uh, I, I would also like to quote Niels Osmar. He said, remember that if we do nothing, 
the aging process of the virus. So now I, after these um, thoughts, I would propose the Elkaya protocol. And it's based on a book I have written. Uh, it has been published a few months ago. It addresses a wide audience. And in part two of that book, I give an overview of promising interventions. Um, most of them end with the phrase, uh, more research is needed. But then I thought, what if we could um, develop uh, a protocol based on all the existing longevity studies? Um, what, what can we do? Uh, what is the best thing we can do now? And can we combine several interventions to propose a protocol or to develop protocols, a protocol uh, to extend healthy lifespan? And these interventions, well, the, the, the basis is a healthy lifestyle because this is, there is enough evidence that this is safe and a good practice. And it's based on the seven pillars, uh, nutrition, physical uh, activity, stress management, social support, sleep, purpose, and environment. Uh, secondly, we can use uh, supplements or proposed supplements, which are generally considered as safe and good, uh, helpful. Then we have medicines, it is more risky, maybe things like rapamycin and medicine. And then we also have uh, some new strategies like uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, uh, microbiome rejuvenation, and also some existing protocols like the TRIM study. And I think we will, we may now expect. Uh, um, the, the result of the TREM X, the second part of the study, I think it was uh, announced to, to finish uh, in November. So, and also uh, another uh, intervention, combined intervention, is that of Dr. Kara um, Fitzgerald. And what is also important, that is measurement, because uh, it's not completely safe. So we have to um, do measurements to control uh, and to minimize the risk. And also we need uh, professional medical supervision. And the characteristics of uh, that protocol is its work in progress. Uh, I, I could say in the end, it will be all right, but it's not quite right. So it's not yet the end as uh, John Lennon said. Uh, and it's a challenging balance based on evidence-based medicine on one hand and biohacking. So it tries to combine principles of safety and also it takes uh, the time it takes. It's a, an open protocol, which, which means that everybody can make uh, suggestions for improvement. Um, we can use uh, the principle of quality circle. Quality circles are, um, it's, um, it was first uh, proposed in, uh, by the industry to improve certain products. And um, the idea is that we are striving for trans transdisciplinary consen consensus in which uh, people from different tens disciplines can um, have their input in it. And so hopefully we can, we will come to consensus. It's also context dependent by which I mean that, for instance, your age is a uh, important factor. If you are 20 years, you will not um, want to take uh, a risk, but in case of you are 70, maybe uh, it's worth uh, taking some risk if there is some uh, promising effectivity. Uh, and what is also an idea 
It's a, a dynamic uh, protocol, which means that it is based on the most recent studies. And that has also a consequence that we are uh, willing to make changes in it as soon as there is new evidence um, urging us to do some changes. So we're making the path by walking it. And to conclude, of course, such a approach is a challenging. Uh, for instance, one question is how to test a changing protocol, uh, how to obtain approval for such a protocol from ethic committees. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to propose these ideas and uh, hope you can help me and, and uh, my colleagues to uh, to develop such a protocol. And what can we expect? We don't know. Uh, is there, well, my hope is that we will, uh, there, there will be synergy so that if you are combining several um, approaches, several uh, interventions, that you may have some generic uh, effects. And um, but also multiple, we have to be aware that multiple beneficial interventions may also be harmful. For instance, if you combine several uh, interventions uh, aiming autophagy, uh, we are not sure that combined it's better than, than one intervention. So we have also to be aware you can buy yourself, uh, buy, buy your hack yourself to that. And so indeed uh, to finish, to conclude, uh, indeed again, we need more research, but uh, preferably before we are dead. And uh, that was my talk and I'm open for uh, your uh, feedback. And you can contact me also uh, on my email. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Re, uh, Reginald. I have uh, one question, but uh, first, maybe there are other questions. Um, I see a comment of Len, uh, and uh, I see a question of uh, Edward. Uh, so the question of Edouard is how can you make biohacking sufficiently legal to be organized by most medical doctors so that populations participate in the knowledge uh, this and then a more comment this might be where the functional medicine current move is going to but maybe because it's kind of in the same domain i will i will ask my question uh, so you can uh, answer to the two questions uh, together. Um, yeah. I, I globally agree with uh, all what you are uh, saying, I would say, but I miss a point about uh, measuring the results of all this uh, biohacking, you know, because if people are, let's say, testing things, but we don't know the results, it's useful for these people, uh, potentially, but not for the uh, for the other uh, potential uh, patients and for this for all people um, uh, uh, getting old. So do you have a proposal concerning this? Because I, yeah, I think it's very important. Yeah, yeah yes, of course. And uh, indeed, the, the real biohackers are, are measuring themselves and using the data for themselves. But here, the idea is to collect all the data and to, to do a study about it. Uh, so this, this is a, indeed a very important aspect. We, we would like to collect all this data. So we have to think about it, that we not just are measuring uh, for individuals, but also to, to, to um, uh, collect all this data. Um, so that's, that's the first uh, question. Then the other question, is it legal? Well biohacking it's not illegal but it's in a gray zone and so we, we have certainly to avoid illegal things but um, 
uh, other interventions like uh, use of metformin and rapamycin are also probably illegal uh, or in the gray zone. So, so we, we have to try to find a solution for that. That is not completely illegal, but I, I agree that it is sometimes at the limit of, of what uh, is um, legal. And then the other question, I, I think, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, DJ? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I mean, I, I think uh, Edouard was uh, asking more uh, how to facilitate, you know, how to make it uh, e more easier um, uh, in a legal way. Yeah. But uh, yeah, you answer. Yeah, that's why because I think DJ and I we have the same view here. If we want to have results, statistics, in fact, we want to organize clinical trials. We don't say it, but that's what we are doing: mini clinical trials between biohackers yeah. or people being biohacked. This, except in Germany for non-invasive uh, approaches, comes into uh, quite a, a legal burden of having, um, as you were saying, approval from ethical committees that are country specific, that are uh, very, very specific. It's a huge work and um, uh, it's complex. Um, and, uh, Medical doctors currently, um, there is no big, no framework for that. Um, so everything that's happening is complex. You need to pay. There is no way to finance this. Um, uh, and, and you always feel uh, about to going to jail for whatever you try to do when it starts to be large. So it's, it's a mistake because medicine is not only about very large clinical trials uh, because of our, it's also about knowledge uh, and gradual knowledge, ground medicine, <laughs> but there is no framework for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with your remarks, but uh, I, I propose to, to work in several steps. And the first step <clears throat> is just uh, developing a, a proposal. Uh, and then the next step is to try to do some kind of clinical trial to um, yeah to, to test this proposal. Okay, thank you, uh, Reginald. I know the floor is for Dr. Johan Valentin Mattei. Uh, Johan is a, a PhD scientific researcher in uh, systems biology of aging group. The, in the Institute of Biochemistry of the Romanian Academy. So please, uh, Johan, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you very much, Didier. I will share my screen shortly. Uh, okay. Uh, is it visible? Is it okay? Can you see my slideshow? Sorry. It's okay. Go. It's okay. Um, so I'd like to talk about uh, the work conducted um, uh, in our department, Systems Biology of Aging Group at the Romanian Institute of uh, Biochemistry, um, which aimed to demonstrate uh, the possibility to predict, uh, successfully predict synergisms between longevity associated genes in C. elegans. Uh, in our case, we worked with ODR3 and IFE2. So, as you know, um, there are a lot of single gene interventions that have been performed in model organisms uh, for lifespan studies, for longevity studies. Over 2200 have been reported in literature. Uh, a great deal of them are functionally conserved across taxa. They share expression patterns. Um, but with regard to gene interactions, with regard to synergy, especially between genes, there is, um, there is a paucity, a relative paucity of data in scientific literature. Um, there has been, there have, have been some studies into gene synergisms for uh, with regard to lifespan. However, most of these pertain to the IIS FOXO pathway, um, 
which is of course the best studied. And in C. elegans, uh, it pertains especially to the DAF2 and DAF16 mm -hmm. genes, which are, of course, as you know, DAF2 is the homologue of um, IGFR family of receptors in mammals and DAF16, the homologue of uh, FOXO. So uh, uh, beginning with, uh, of course, the uh, Kenyan lab seminal paper in the early 90s that uh, made this case for DAF2, uh, this has been the most widely studied functional pathway in C. elegans as well as other model organisms for aging. So DAF2, of course, regulates uh, endocrine responses to food availability, intermediate metab everything that almost everything that pertains to in uh, intermediate metabolism. Uh, it does have a proven effect on longevity, dour formation, fat metabolism, and so forth. And mutations that reduce functionality of DAF2 extend lifespan through a DAF16 dependent uh, mechanism. Now. Because of this, uh, of course, the IIS pathway is the logical entry point for any studies pertaining to gene interactions in model organisms. Uh, our group is, of course, uh, mostly made up of bioinformaticians. Of course, we have wet lab expertise, but uh, so our, our coordinator, our head, uh, Robbie's idea was to uh, generate a bioinformatic by, you know, create a database of putative gene interactions, as well as a bioinformatic pipeline that could successfully predict um, synergistic gene interactions for, for LAGs, for longevity associated genes, both negative and positive regulators of longevity. So uh, based on this, uh, a series of genes were selected. Uh, the main criteria was, as stated earlier, interaction with the DAF2 pathway. So, there are genes that yielded a positive effect on lifespan in a DAF2 silencing uh, background. And uh, the shortlisted uh, genes and combinations were further manually curated until we wound up with a list of three genes that seemed extremely promising to us. And those are ODR3, IFE2, and CKU70. Uh, ODR3, uh, as some of you may know, is, is the ortholog of G protein subalpha unit in mammals. It's expressed only in a handful of uh, sensory neurons in C. elegans. And uh, ODR3 knockdown results in essentially olfactory mutants. So basically, they're animals that are unable to uh, have normal chemosensitivity in their environment. However, they are long lived despite or perhaps because of this. IFE2 is, uh, is the orthologue of uh, mammalian EIF4E. So it's an elongation factor that's involved in protein synthesis and its inactivation as well has been proven to protect against oxidative stress and to extend lifespan. And decrease of course the rate of protein synthesis and thereby stabilize reactive oxygen species homeostasis. CQ70 uh, is, is, a, is a helicase. It's, uh, it's the ortholog of a million Q70. It's involved in, in DNA repair. And while it's silencing, does increase sensitivity to genotoxic stress and to heat stress and others. Um, it does increase the lifespan of DAF2 mutants by an insufficiently characterized mechanism. So it, it, it looked like a good candidate. So all of these uh, three genes uh, potentiate the life extending effects of DAF2, uh, of DAF2 silenced organisms. And with that in mind, we, we set out to assess the effects of combined interventions in these three genes on C. elegans lifespan and health span uh, to investigate crosstalk with the IIS pathway by way of DAF16. In other words, to verify whether any possible pro-longevity effects that we find by silencing them uh, depend on the activation of the IIS pathway. And of course, in the process of all this to validate the bioinformatic pathway of generating predictions for gene synergisms in uh, the study of longevity. Um, uh, a quick note is, uh, so 
example of the whenever whenever I say uh, mutants, so in all cases I'm referring to to silencing. So these genes were silenced by way of RNA interference. Uh, we used, of course, the most widely used tool for this, which is the Oranger RNAi library for C. elegans, which is quite widely used for these purposes. Essentially, you feed the worm. Uh, some of you may know, of course, you feed the worm bacteria, which have a plasmid that produces a double-stranded RNA, which interferes with the expression of the gene of interest. Um, and an another quick note, whenever I will talk about increase in lifespan or health span, I'm referring to lifespan or health span as assessed by percentage change of mean and maximum lifespan and health span. So um, with that in mind, um, uh, our first uh, our first uh, goal was to check uh, lifespan assays for uh, double mutants, ODR3 IFE double mutants. That is to say, ODR3 mutants fed with IFE2 RNAi, and we indeed found that um, the joint silencing of ODR3 and IFE2 yields an additive effect. That is to say. Um, the percentage change of mean and maximum lifespan uh, is roughly equal to the sum of the individual effects on lifespan for the for the single mutants, as you can see in the figure on the left, where uh, the green uh, curve, the green survival curve for the double mutant, uh, has a percentage change that is roughly the sum of the individual single mutants. Um, CKU, by way of contrast. Uh, dramatically decreased the extension of lifespan conferred by the ODR3 mutation, as can be seen on the right. So um, ODR3 is uh, depicted in blue. ODR3 CKU double mutant is depicted in orange. So at least on average, CKU did not uh, impart a positive effect on lifespan extension. Uh, furthermore, uh, if you look see on the figure on the right, um, when tested on double mutants on ODR3 IFE2 animals, CKU again uh, decreased their lifespan, uh, both uh, mean and maximum, as can be seen for the purple curve, the purple survival curve, as compared to the light green one on the right depicting the double mutant ODR3 IFE2. The only combination in which CKU70 was found to have a um, somewhat positive effect on lifespan was when silenced jointly with IFE2, where it yielded a um, statistically significant but biologically questionable 15% increase in uh, mean survival. So, okay, uh, with this in mind, we set out to verify whether um, these effects depend or not on the IIS signaling pathway by way of DAF16, which is the most common uh, node to check this. So uh, using DAF16 uh, mutants and DAF16 ODR3 double mutants, uh, we check to see whether, um, whether this, uh, this particular um, factor is is involved in the joint in in the lifespan increase that is yielded by the joint inactivation of ODR3 and IFE2. And as can be seen in the figure on the left, the DAF16 ODR3 uh, double mutants depicted in light blue were shorter lived compared with the single mutants DAF16 depicted in dotted black lines, whereas IFE2 DAF16 mutants depicted in dotted red lines were slightly longer lived than the DAF16 single mutants. Um, DAF16 CKU depicted on the right in green, in the green dotted line, closely mirrors the DAF16 single mutants. So it doesn't look like, DAF, like CKU70 RNAi influences the lifespan of double mutants in any way. Uh, again, CKU70 silencing does not improve lifespan. It uh, DAF16 CKU70 closely mirrors DAF16 as depicted on the left. So uh, CKU70 as well did not influence the lifespan of the quadruple mutant as depicted on the right in the purple dotted line, again, closely mirroring the DAF16 single mutant. So uh, what this suggests is that 
well, of course, CKU does not yield any positive effects on lifespan, and that uh, the IFE two ODR three combination is not does not appear to function in a DAF sixteen or DAF two dependent manner. Now, to validate this further, we checked uh, using confocal microscopy for signs of nuclear translocation of DAF sixteen. That is to say. Uh, worms expressing a fused fluorescent DAF-16 GFP construct were analyzed for visualization of uh, uh, nuclear translocation of DAF-16. And this could only be identified for intestinal cells in the ODR3 mutant and not in the IFE2 mutant nor in the ODR3 IFE2 double mutant which uh, of course suggests that the joint effect of ODR3 and IFE2 is not DAF16 dependent, possibly occurring downstream of the of DAF16 and of the DAF2 DAF16 signaling axis. Um, good practice dictates that whenever you do feeding with interfering RNA for C. elegans, you also validate the data with constitutive mutants, with, with um, um, mutant strains uh, that silence the same genes that were fed by way of the Oranger library. So we did this. Uh, and while the effects were lower in magnitude, the trend was largely maintained. That is to say, um, ODR3 IFE2 yielded a, uh, an additive increase in lifespan compared with the single mutants. An interesting observation that we found here was that the absence of fooder, uh, so fooder is a compound that it's, that's added to C. elegans culture in order to sterilize them when you do a uh, long-term observation of lifespan and health span. Usually it increases health span uh, you, sorry, uh, usually it increases, um, uh, the addition of fooder usually increases the lifespan for all strains. Whereas in our case, we found that uh, the absence of fooder increased lifespan for all strains. Um, this is an open scientific question and we suspect that it's a hermetic effect that's at work here that accounts for this uh, observation. Now, um, having found uh, the additive effect of joint silencing of I IFE2 and ODR3, um, and of course, no significant lifespan enhancing effects on CKU70. We went forward to check for um, IFE2 and ODR3 joint effects on health span. Um, one of the most important uh, ways in which one can assess health span is uh, by way of motility. So it's an, by way of sarcopenia, an indirect measurement of sarcopenia. That is to say, loss of motility with aging. And to do that, um, we devised a semi quantitative score. We graded worms A, B, and C. That is to say, fully mobile, which is A, corresponding to normal unencumbered motility. Uh, B, or impaired worms, which corresponded to worms that could move either freely or on response to prodding, but on a radius no larger than 0.5 centimeters, and frail worms which exhibited only faint movements, only in response to prodding and for a very limited uh, range, for a very limited axis. Um, analyzing this data closer, we found that the effects on health span um, while consistent with those on, on lifespan, did not closely mirror them. So for instance, the percentage spent in a healthy state, in a fully healthy state um, was for, for ODR3, as opposed to the percentage of, um, uh, of their lifespan that they spent in impaired or frail states. So while ODR3 individually generated the highest effect on lifespan, this was not the case for health span. And conversely for IFE2, while the dual mutant uh, did exhibit a decrease in the percentage of frail state uh, worms that was significant. So starting from this observation, we decided to quantify the issue more thoroughly. And we made- uh, Jan, yeah, yeah, sorry to interrupt. Can you conclude in uh, two minutes, please, or two sure. or three? 
for sure. Uh, because we're reaching. Yeah, so, sorry. Yeah, no problem. You, you, sorry, sorry. The, sorry. the last are paying for the first. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, having analyzed uh, the transition between motility, between fully mobile and impaired and frail, we concluded that um, there's a significant uh, effect. Uh, in, uh, the synergism occurs. Uh, it's a fully it, so the increase in health span, the decrease in transition from full motility to impair and frailness for the double mutants was a fully synergistic effect. That is to say, its magnitude was greater than the sum of the individual mutants. And the same could be found for pharyngeal pumping, where um, the decrease for the double mutant in the intensity of pharyngeal pumping uh, closely mirrored this pattern. And at day 15, um, the maintenance uh, of pharyngeal pumping was 187%, which is greater than the sum of the individual effects for the single mutants. Uh, we didn't find any synergisms for tolerance to oxidative stress or heat stress. Productivity was maintained. But the key takeaways are that ODR3 and IFE exert an additive effect on lifespan, a synergistic effect on health span as expressed by uh, motility and pharyngeal pumping that depletion of ODR3 and IFE2 does not affect fecundity, promotes muscle activity, maintains the activation of stress response mechanisms, and that ODR3 and IFE2 have opposite effects in a DAF16 background and approach the single mutant jointly suggesting convergence downstream of DAF16 and independence of it. CKU, of course, did not yield any effects. I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, Vimbai Samukange, Gabriela Bunu, Dmitri Toren, Simona Gena, and Robita Takutu. Uh, the Gerontomics Fund, the Gerontomics Project that funded this work, as well as Maria Koval and Anton Kulaga for help with slide design. Thank you very much. Open for questions. Thank you very much, uh, Johan. Uh, sorry that I was pushing you. No so, problem. Um, sorry, I <laughs> yeah. went over. Yeah. No, no, no. It's I think uh, it's okay. We are uh, more or less in time. We have time uh, for I would say one question uh, but i don't see question in the uh, chat at the moment so if there is somebody who want uh, ah uh, alexandra uh alexandru uh yeah please uh, speak yeah hi uh Yuan. really cool hey, presentation uh, i just wanted to ask you two very short bits sure so thing the first one is um related to the fact that you know c elegance is one of the organisms where very high lifespan uh full change has been seen so like you know like 200 300 percent has yeah. been seen in, in other studies and i was wondering these these interactions between these genes are very interesting in terms of mechanism and in terms of figuring out you know what's happening and what's the sort of pathology of it but at the same time the sort of total lifespan extension even together in an additive way is kind of like 50 percent or something like yes. that if i guesstimated yes. right from the plot I was yeah. wondering, you know, how, how 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 do you think we could step further to sort of like um, look for interactions that have, you know, like five hundred percent lifespan extension in worms, which is by any measure, you know, like not a lot. It's just a few months, but um, sure, sure thing. So the way I would uh, awesome question. Thank you. Th thanks a lot. So yeah, it's 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 uh, it's an astute observation that yeah, the effect in itself is interesting. We were happy to be able to find. Um, two genes that interacted synergistically on health span, additively on lifespan, but yeah, the magnitude in itself compared with other previously documented effects in C. elegans is not huge. Uh, however, I would say that this sets a precedent for the way in which one would approach synergistic gene combinations in C. elegans. And hopefully with uh, you know, the assistance of my bioinformatically astute colleagues, we can, we can generate further data that will lead to testing combinations that may yield even higher um, lifespan extensions. So I'll take it more as a comment than a question and would say that, yeah, we should use this pipeline to identify even stronger genes that might yield better synergisms than the one here and presented. Okay. okay, thank you again, uh, Johan. And now uh, the floor is uh, to uh, Anton 
Cool again, and uh, after that, somebody else I will present. Uh, so Anton Kulaga is speak, speaking also with another person. So Anton Kulaga is a bioinformatician at the Computational Biology of Aging Group, mm -hmm. University of Bucharest. Uh, mm -hmm. Anton, the floor is yours. Ah, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, I'm also very happy that uh, in uh, this session, we briefly touched uh, uh, democratizing longevity for everyone, uh, starting with longevity protocol. And uh, my talk actually is also about uh, getting personal on uh, our longevity and uh, devoted to longevity genomics. Uh, so, uh, as I'm getting personal, I probably have to say a few words about uh, our team. So, uh, we have a distributed uh, team uh, uh, working in a remote fashion. So, uh, I will co-present with uh, Olga Borisova, who will uh, tell the second part of presentation. And uh, the way how it started was also uh, really personal for me. So it was me and uh, the white rabbit uh, on the left corner in the beginning. And uh, even though I am involved in uh, both academia and industry, where I am colleague of uh, Ioan Matei, uh, pre previous presenter, uh, actually, this project started with my uh, personal interest uh, because I am bioinformatician, I uh, felt like uh, I am a shoemaker um, without shoes because I uh, didn't analyze my uh, personal genome. And uh, I discovered that it's super cheap to do whole genome sequencing that I did like for $300 uh, with uh, Dante. And uh, I decided to analyze myself. So uh, started uh, from writing by informatic pipeline because uh, it was uh, the easiest thing to do. And of course, I open sourced uh, everything. And uh, after that, uh, the white rabbit, Newton Winter Anonymous uh, contributor joined me. Uh, we improved it to be better than Dante, so we added some deep learning based variant calling and some other tricks. And uh, what we faced it is that uh, we did three steps like uh, uh, assembling genome, uh, then writing code, and uh, uh, when we got already annotated genome, we discovered that uh, there is a huge amount of ways how you can interpret those. Uh, several million variants that you get uh, after you after your pipeline worked and then uh, we got stuck busy with other stuff uh, until uh, uh, until uh, the git coin happened uh, so the git coin was uh, uh, a, an open source uh, uh, grant, grant round and we thought okay maybe we could uh, collect uh, several hundred uh, dollars uh, or maybe a thousand to do a little bit more and uh, uh, we learned about it like two days before the deadline so uh, we didn't have time so we took a picture from uh, PyMall and just said okay let we let us be just DNA sequencing Surprise, surprisingly we managed to collect 70,000 and build a team and um, uh, when we built a team, we decided, okay, what should we start with? And uh, actually, we decided to start from the very beginning and uh, looking what we should actually have done before we before we sequenced ourselves is uh, how heritable is uh, uh, longevity and other traits. And um, uh, we actually checked, and uh, it's there are different estimates, but uh, it is from uh, uh, 10 to 30 percent based on different uh, methods. And there are two major methods. So you can assess it by uh, twin studies and you can also assess it by uh, genomics. And usually you have higher heritability by twin studies because our genomic models uh, are not super good, so they cannot explain uh, many heritable factors. And also we know that uh, super longevity is more heritable than uh, 
uh, longevity for most uh, of the people. Uh, also, some people uh, did different family studies. It uh, is somewhat similar to twin studies, but uh, larger population and uh, not twins. And uh, there were also some interesting findings that in some cases, like with Huntington diseases, uh, it's also um, a balance between uh, uh, different uh, repeats uh, that matters, not only like uh, absence or presence of uh, longevity genes. And uh, we also studied, okay, uh, we know the heritability, what uh, else useful can be done with it? Of course, uh, uh, we can uh, think about uh, our own personal risk, but we can also search for targets uh, for different gene therapies. And uh, the other thing is actually something that we are doing now. We uh, actually applying now for UK Biobank access to see if we can add genomic components to aging clocks uh, to actually improve their prediction, assuming that heritability, even though it's pretty small uh, from like 10 to 30%, can improve the precision. And uh, with this preliminary research, we actually started uh, be building open source uh, modules uh, on top of uh, open source OAKVAR uh, platforms that, that uh, annotated our uh, risks uh, for uh, different diseases. And we made the major focus on uh, longevity that was missing in uh, proposals of Dante, Nebula, and different uh, commercial companies. And with this, I want to give uh, the word to my uh, co-presenter, Olga, who actually uh, worked a lot and did most of the works with uh, our reports. Yes, thank you, Anton. So we put our hopes for radical life extension on genetics, but let's move back to our platform. And first of all, we have to discover important longevity variants that we have in our own genome. And the aim of our project actually is to give everyone the ability to discover these variants in own genomes. So uh, our platform is called JustDNA-Sec and uh, it consists of OAKVAR modules. OAKVAR is an open source genomic variant analysis platform bioinformatics pipelines and traditional libraries. So uh, how can you use it? Actually, it's very easy. Uh, all you have to do is have your genome sequenced and it uh, you can do it at any private lab. It's quite cheap, as Anton already mentioned. And then you can um, upload your VCF file into the platform and um, the good stuff in it is that you don't have to be a geneticist. So you don't have any more to choose annotators, filters, we have already done it for you. So after you're uploading your VCF file, you will receive a file with um, longevity report interpretation, and it concludes um, actually some submodules, longevity variants, longevity polygenic risk scores, longevity drugs, and age-related disease risks. And I will tell you a little bit more about them. And after receiving your report, you can just discover your longevity potential and use it uh, in, your day, in your daily life. Uh, so the first report in our platform is longevity variance report. And it is mainly based on longevity map. Uh, we have um, did a lot of stuff with it and we want to I give our great thanks to Joao Pedro for his kind help with his work with the database. Uh, and as well, it also contains other data sources. And actually now it is um, about almost 2,000 variants, uh, which are scored and prioritized according to multiple crit criteria. So you can see in your report uh, weight of this uh, variant. Um, whether you are homozygous or heterozygous, your genotype, and you can, by double-clicking uh, this line, see additional information about uh, pathways of longevity, where this um, SNP is involved, about uh, whether you can influence it and by which ways. 
uh, and so on. Green one are positive, so pro-longevity, and the red one are kind of negative, anti-longevity. Uh, and so a little bit uh, wanna add that uh, while we were building our module and report, um, actually we did a lot of work with the database and we have updated longevity map. And uh, now we uh, on a stage of building um, interface prototype on React, or we hope uh, to have um, an, a new version of longevity map. Uh, so, what can you discover from your longevity associated variants? First of all, none of us has perfect genes, and um, there is some stuff from Anton's genome, and I would say he kind of a lucky one. Uh, and uh, here you can see two important uh, genes, APOE. APOE is a gene which is strongly associated with longevity in multiple populations, and actually it still holds a leadership position in predicting, like, longevity associated gene and uh, you can uh, have positive allele like E2 or negative E4 and most of us have like intermediate E3 but uh, Anton has um, a very rare variant E2 E4 variant uh, one is unfavorable but another is favorable and actually the favorable favorable one is very strong and actually it overwhelms the risks of unfavorable. So in that case, I wouldn't be too nervous and maybe just learn one more language and add some rosemary into food uh, to make some neuroprotection. But actually, for people who hold both um, uh, unfavorable E4 variants, it's uh, a dangerous stuff because it's a strong prediction of um, neurodegeneration and uh, both the probability of development and severity. So you have to think about um, more serious stuff. And another gene, Anton also has a lot of positive SNPs uh, uh, changes in FOXOS3 gene. And it is identified as the second most replicated gene associated with extreme human longevity. Um, the mechanisms we still are discovering and don't know for sure, but most probably it maintains cardiovascular homeostasis. But despite several single genes, uh, it is crucial for longevity to estimate polygenic risk scores. Polygenic risk scores aggregate the effect of many common genetic variants to estimate a person's chances of gaining extreme longevity. Each variant of on its own tends little on the total outcome, but when added together, this difference can have a more significant impact and various is calculated as a weighted sum of trait associated alleles. And it is represented as a percentile within a given population. For example, it's also from Anton's genome. If you have a 94th percentile, it means your genetic change, chances to gain extreme longevity is higher than uh, 94 of every 100 people in a chosen population. And now our report is based on the existing longevity polygenic scores, which we take um, uh, from a base, but we just, uh, and we implemented them, but soon we will be able to calculate our own scores. Uh, and uh, as Anton already uh, told, we have an access to UK Biobank and think about doing something nice with it. And another important stuff for longevity are uh, longevity drugs. Actually, drug metabolism to a large extent depends on a person's genetic polymorphisms, uh, which affects um, the activity of xenobiotics transforming enzymes. So it's uh, a common situation when individual um, dose corruption is needed or even another drug uh, has to be taken in order to avoid adverse effect. Um, for example, uh, aspirin, we use it like for antiplatelet option, uh, but it doesn't um, have this effect for everyone, depending on gene variant and statins, which are widely prescribed, they may lead to rhabdominolysis, it's breaking down of muscle cells, it's not that common, but anyway, it's better to avoid it when it's possible, and especially uh, pharmacogenetics is important when it comes to drugs you're taking on a, on a daily basis, like every day, like statins, metformin, antidepressants, and longevity drugs, and we hope there will be more and more longevity drugs, 
because now we work um, mainly with um, like commonly prescribed uh, cardiovascular drugs, anti-diabetic drugs, and uh, our report is based mainly on farm GKB database, and we also added manually some information um, uh, about um, which uh, effects this drug uh, has for longevity and also personal risks as well. Uh, for example, for statins, if you uh, have a good response, you are highly responsible for statins, you might start with a lower dose and get advantages for a lower dose. So it's no need to increase your dosage and uh, which will increase uh, the risk of adverse effects as well. Um, as a genetic staff, actually, we started with longevity variants, but it's not enough to have centenarian genes to become one, and you have to cut down your health risks before. Um, and this section contains information about the risk of developing age-associated and chronic diseases like cardiovascular, cancer, mental health diseases, uh, your risk to develop high degree of uh, chronic inflammation, bone and muscle diseases and lung diseases. Uh, we have already implemented several uh, polygenic risk scores for diseases, and here the situation is opposite. The higher score you have, the more uh, likely you have to develop some risks. So in that situation, it has good scores for coronary heart disease, so low probability to develop one, but should be attentive to blood clots. Uh, so. Uh, also, we have implemented uh, some other polygenic risk scores for uh, atherosclerosis and C-reactive protein measurement, it will go to the section of um, inflammation. Uh, and besides uh, polygenic risk scores, um, uh, we have um, also in built in these modules uh, lists with important SMPs for particular diseases. And cardiovascular report uh, is almost ready, and it consists of coronary, coronary artery disease risk, thrombophilia risk, uh, rare hereditary, uh, rare hereditary uh, diseases risk, and atherosclerosis risk. We also have a cancer report, onco risk report, and now we are working on osteoporosis module, mental health module, inflammation, and lung disease module. So as you see, we have a lot of plans and uh, our main task for now is to bring longevity research to daily people life and uh, increase the involvement into uh, the longevity community uh, by making transparent and open platform for personal genomics. And uh, that's why our today's topic is longevity genetics for everyone. And thanks for listening. And if you have any questions, we would be happy to, um, to answer them. Thank you very much, uh, Olga. Thank you also, uh, Anton. Uh, we have time for one or two questions, but not more. Uh, I saw one question uh, in the chat. Uh, if you saw it already, I had to find it back. Uh, uh, it was a question from Philip van den Arvelt. Philip, if you are, uh, if you can say it uh, directly, uh, it's it's easier for me. <laughs> I would say. But otherwise, where did I? Or oh, somebody else can can read it. I don't find it back in at the moment. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Philip. Yes. Uh, I, yeah, I can read. It. Yeah. Uh, when a person has yeah. both APOE4 genes, uh, then what more serious preventive measures does this person need to take to reduce the high risk of cognitive decline? Yeah, thanks for the question. We're all hoping for gene therapy, uh, but for now, all we can do to precisely control our inflammation level, uh, control insulin resistance, because insulin resistance was shown, was shown to be highly correlated with uh, Alzheimer, and insulin resistance is not just peripheral, just like muscle, etc., but it also can occur in our brain and it leads to neuroinflammation and increases risks of Alzheimer. So controlling inflammation level, controlling like blood glucose level, resistance to insulin, like that stuff. And we all hope that some 
some more radical drugs will come soon. Thank you, Olga. I see, uh, but I don't know the name, somebody uh, asking uh, to speak, uh, VSMKOV, <laughs> sorry. Ah, and yeah, and Philippe also. Okay, the, the first one who speaks, uh, and yeah. Didier, Go bonjour. Uh, bonjour, Didier, it's Vlad, Vladimir. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Um, Olga, uh, lovely presentation. Um, a question. Um, what are the uh, public? Are you taking your project outside to a larger public um, outside of the outside of the community? And how are you going to do that? Uh, well, I think Anton will tell more about it. We have uh, all our, it's an open source project and we have all our pipelines um, on GitHub. And now we can advertising. So our project just in the longevity community at conferences, congresses, etc. Uh, and actually, we, uh, I, I don't know how can we do it further, but we have some communication with Dante Lab. So uh, we have some preliminary agreements. So if uh, people, for example, don't have already uh, genome sequenced, they can send the material to Dante Lab and probably Dante Lab can, can somehow advise our report for longevity because they don't have their own longevity stuff. Sure. Uh, yeah, I can uh, add a few words. So in our case, um... Yeah, we open source all the code and also everything is trackable in uh, a way that uh, unlike you have with many companies, you, here you actually know how this or that result was computed. So everybody can fork the code and extend it. Then uh, we also, uh, from time to time, we also make workshops. Uh, we, for example, we made... Uh, uh, hack your own genome workshop where we taught people how to analyze uh, your own genome because uh, all of our platforms that we build on top of it is actually has a proper interface for uh, manual genome investigation. So you get not only reports, but you have uh, tools uh, to actually manually, you have some variants of interest and you can manually investigate them. Our code is so far uh, published with a copyleft uh, license, but uh, for people who want to uh, collaborate with us uh, B2B, we can uh, actually do a license it. So far, our policy is uh, to be open uh, for everybody for non-commercial purpose, but uh, those who want to uh, collaborate commercially, we can uh, uh, discuss it. So I understand. And also, that. feel free to contact me uh, or Olga. We have over all our contacts, uh, so you can know more. Sure. So, if I understand, you okay, want to basic. I'm, I'm sorry, DJ. So, so if yeah, I I, uh, yeah, I leave you. I leave you thirty seconds, and then uh, we stop there. <laughs> no, no, or just uh, least, yeah. So, sorry, yeah. yeah. So you understand, you you want at some stage to basically make it kind of license for the labs, if I understand correctly, Anton. This is your dream scenario. Uh, not for the labs. I mean, if commercial companies uh, actually, uh, we have some options. So far, we have funding, uh, Gitcoin funding, until I believe uh, end of spring. And uh, right now we just develop out of this funding and uh, afterwards, uh, this is one of the options how we can collaborate if there will be public grants or anything else. Uh, we don't have like a concrete strategy that we just go uh, this model or not that model because our aim is to just make uh, things available because you can run stuff on your laptop, you don't need to like uh, have any centralized authority to provide your analysis if you fork the code. Okay, thank you, Anton. Thank you, Olga and uh, Vladimir. So now, uh, Laurence Ion will uh, speak. Uh, he's a longevity uh, advocate, uh, investor in steward of the D Flow working group at uh, Vita DAO. Please, Laurent. The your turn. Thank you. Speaking of uh, not needing centralized authorities, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, thank you uh, for providing that intro there. Um, right, so I'm going to try to figure out how to uh, make it look good. Does this, can you see this? Yes, it's okay. All right. Um, yeah, so um, I'm happy to be here. Thank you again for organizing this every year. It's it's a it's a very nice meeting point, and I see a lot of uh, familiar, dear faces here. Um, yeah, I'm a steward uh, of the DealFlow Longevity DealFlow Working Group at Vida Dao, and um, I'll get more into all of that. Um, I I want to talk about how we are helping accelerate the development of these longevity therapeutics. And I'm also going to talk about how you can get funding, um, also via G Gitcoin. Uh, we started the longevity Gitcoin round that got the previous presentations project funded. So I'm very happy to see that evolving. Um, yeah, so I'll give a brief intro, but I want this to be um, interactive, uh, decentralize the conversation a little bit, leave, leave enough time for, for discussion <clears throat> on conference a little bit. But first to tell you a bit about the funding collective that is Vida Dao. You might have heard of, about us. Um, tell you a bit about how we do things and and why. Um, so we're a new type of organization. It's you know online first. Uh, we want to create a world where longevity therapeutics are collectively funded and owned and governed by the population that will benefit from them ultimately. Uh, you know patients and the public. Um, and this can be achieved through an open structure um, that um, moves longevity funding and development out of centralized authorities and into decentralized communities. Um, and we, um, the main points here are um, this, you know, everyone knows this here, but um, yeah, drugs that target aging are the future of medicine. Um, they tackle age-related disease at the root cause. Um, and why, why a DAO, why a decentralized autonomous organization? Well, we noticed that the top uh, key opinion leaders in crypto Web3 are incredibly aligned with this new paradigm, this new approach to, to medicine. Um, and I think it makes sense. You know, you kind of have both this sort of new financial technology of Web3 and crypto, uh, as well as the sort of longevity biotech, uh, both are sort of dismissed by the incumbents, the, you know, the government, the Wall Streets, the National Institutes of uh, Health, and so on. And it makes sense to kind of unite these forward thinkers that are um, both forward thinkers economically and forward thinkers scientifically, um, and create this, you, you get uh, take advantage of this new type of uh, internet first structure. Um, so we together as a community incubate, help uh, applicants, um, researchers uh, improve their projects, and then we fund the, the research, therefore hopefully creating more startups, uh, accelerating progress. I noticed as an investor that there weren't enough startups and it doesn't make sense to just make a VC fund. Um, so yeah, the, the main idea here is through this big community, uniting people towards a common goal of advancing this and, and democratizing um, both the um, impact and the exposure to uh, this new field of rejuvenation biotech. Um, and as a scalable organization, um, we can deploy funding much faster. We can incubate uh, these projects exponentially faster than traditional um, organizations, mainly because we are um, open and permissionless. Anyone can contribute funds, anyone can apply for funding, and um, anyone can contribute work and collaborate with us. And of course, using this VITA token uh, for aligning incentives to just kind of enable the network effects, the unprecedented scalability here, um, also enable fair evaluation and incubation without sort of top down, more like a, a bottom up approach and to accelerating progress. 
And yeah, drug development, as you know, has been focused on treating effects instead of the cause of all chronic age-related diseases, which is aging itself. Um, also, you know, IP ownership has been stuck. Uh, you know, we have to call people in business suits and um, ask, uh, trying to do a, a, a business deal. Um, it's not really uh, up to the standards of 21st century. It's really illiquid. It's really difficult to transfer. And there's a long horizon to exit. And we can do much better. Uh, we can allow yeah, public and patients to, to have real ownership in intellectual property. Um, you, we see that there's valuable IP in university um, and it just kind of gets shelved uh, because it's not investable until a startup is spun out. And that is the, I, I would say the biggest problem from the, from the value of death. Um, and yeah, you've got these government grants that are you know, bureaucratic and and boring. You have to write hundreds of pages. Uh, a lot of researchers spend the majority of their time kind of trying to fundraise. And of course, it's really slow. Funds can come up in up to two years. Um, and you've got, you know, this entrenchment of the status quo uh, with a very top-down risk-averse um, bureaucratic approach. Um, so the solution, um, we've got this... Uh, larger sort of decentralized science space and Viradao within it, focusing on, on longevity. Um, yeah, you all know about the successes of uh, sort of slowing down or, or stopping aging in, in uh, model organisms by dozens of pharmacological interventions. This is a point that I think uh, raises eye eyebrows in the pharma community. Um, when you talk to, to the traditional people, I think this is uh, showing some feasibility. Um, so yeah, this approach I think has a lot of merit. Um, and yeah, this, I think accelerating these therapeutics in um, as fast as possible uh, without the barriers of um, you know, profit seeking top-down institutions. Um, I think this is the only goal. Otherwise we're all heading towards the carpeted and suffering and death. Um, so it's it's something that the whole planet, I think, should align towards. I don't know why uh, this is not the case yet, but well, we leverage a global scientist-led community because um, we're super diverse uh, and accessible. Um, unlike you know trying to get hired at a VC fund um, or needing a PhD in biology, um, anyone can add value here. Um, we've attracted thousands of people to help with deal flow, due diligence, um, you know, refer projects to us, help the applicants refine the R&D plan, the experimental plan um, towards something more translatable, uh, more valuable. And um, we use these NFTs, non-fungible tokens. Uh, we call them IP NFTs. Um, they can represent legal contracts like license agreements, SRAs, royalty agreements even. And then we tokenize them. We put them on, on the blockchain in a digital way. So, um, you know, it's saying like whoever is the, the, the legal contract itself is saying whoever is the owner of this token has these rights. And then the NFT also embeds that legal contract within it. So it's kind of like this two-way binding. And we can enable liquidity, ease of transfer. We can enable fractionalization. We can uh, not only fractionalize the asset ownership, but also fractionalize governance of, of each therapeutic, each asset. Um, we can give sub-licenses to people. We can give you know, potential vouchers to, to people that if this therapeutic ends up um, in to, to be on the market, um, whereas initially, if, if it was a biotech company or pharma company, you couldn't actually invest because you're not an accredited investor. This way, at least you get maybe a, a, a voucher. Um, and of course, you can buy multiple of these. We haven't yet launched fractionalization, but stay tuned. Um, I think that's going to be a, a very powerful thing to, to sort of align communities around uh, specific uh, potential medicines. And yeah, we form these uh, new startups via a decentralized tech transfer model. So instead of trying to um, work with the TTOs, the tech transfer offices, the bureaucrats there at universities and, and negotiate for many months. 
we rather form a virtual biotech. It's much faster and efficient um, and uh, work with the researcher as a consultant um, and do the experiments at uh, CROs and as like, yeah, just a virtual company and um, also can work with uh, academic collaborators, but usually you cannot work with their own uh, lab if you do this um, DTT model. Um, but there are, so of course there are many pros, um, but that's the, that's a caveat. If you want to avoid the laborious sort of negotiation process, um, with the monopolistic universities, you gotta, um, do these things outside of the lab of the PI. And, um, this way, of course, researchers can get more skin in the game and spending time directing the research, not bureaucracy, not having to clear every, you know, hundred dollars on using pipettes or whatever. Um, and of course we, um, after a killer experiments, the asset become, becomes investable by traditional VCs, angels even. Um, and we work with a few already, um, like Apollo and Healthspan VC and uh, more, a new sort of strategic member of VitaDAO, Pfizer, and um, yeah, a few others as well. And um, we want to make it um, the friendliest experience, experience to apply for funding, to serve the researcher and the research, the medicine we all need to be as, as fast as and, and efficient and quick as possible. Um, and we have this uh, circular model where the proceeds flow back into the treasury, scaling our impact. Um, just over a year uh, and a few months, We've accomplished quite a lot, sourced hundreds of projects and funded over 15, 16, um, and uh, many thousands of community members and token holders. Uh, ticket size is about 50 to 50K to a million. Um, and we've already deployed about uh, some something over 3 million in a bunch of projects here, some um, featured ones. Uh, we have some ac academic labs. Um, a few more advanced startups as well that can put medicine into people sooner. Um, we can, of course, get into specifics for each one. Um, and so the, the first uh, spin-outs will be with uh, Vera Gorbanova. We call it uh, Matrix Pharma. I should have put the logo here, but anyway. And also maybe we'll see um, soon a progress report from uh, the Morton Shabai uh lab, the first project we funded and how we can advance this uh, into a startup and a clinical trial, hopefully. Um, so apart from the core focus, like I said earlier at the beginning, um, we started this longevity quadratic funding round via Gitcoin and, and that evolved over a few rounds. And uh, it's also now a broader DSI, decentralized science round. Um, and all of these are some side projects um, and nonprofit initiatives that we've uh, started to support the field. Um, so yeah, we have a, a longevity prize, um, starting with a hypothesis prize of 20K. We have funders for these, such as Vitalik Buterin, Matuzela Foundation, and, and thousands of people via Gitcoin. Um, and uh, also we have this uh, fellowship that was also funded via Gitcoin and, and the hackathon that, uh, is an evolution of the long hack hackathon that some of you might know. Um, there's uh, an application period open and uh, the next one is uh, on January 13th. So don't hesitate to sign up there. Um, right, so yeah, I would uh, invite you all to join and um, you, know, you can, um, get tokens, participate in governance and decide what gets funded, uh, get compensated for your work. Um, so uh, if you're a researcher, you can, um, uh, this is up outdated, but uh, we will have a new deadline for applications for funding, um, but you can also apply late. It's not a problem. It's generally uh, good to uh, apply by the deadline, but uh, we review things um, maybe slower, but uh, all the time on a rolling basis. So if you know a researcher, we have a bounty system um, for sourcing and uh, 
diligence work as well. So you can um, make a referral. And yeah, if you we have open roles if you want to get involved. Um, uh, everyone is a is a member. It's a very flat structure. Uh, there are a few stewards which kind of facilitate and guide everyone to, to do their job and have some responsibilities. But um, yeah, that's the that's the basic uh, thing. And I'd love to to see what you guys think. If you have any questions, and um, how can I help you get involved? Any feedback? Any ideas? Okay. Okay, then, thank you, uh, Lawrence. Uh, at the moment, I don't see um, any question uh, in the chat. So uh, if there is somebody wanting to speak, speak immediately. Otherwise, I have one question also, but uh, I would prefer somebody else to be the first one. I saw Leon, uh, Leon or Leon. Um, okay, Le Leon, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I, 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 yeah, I, I, I uh, put a question in the chat. Do you see yourself organizing the actual effort uh, needed in longevity and and uh, you know big crowdsourced effort where people contribute uh, some sort of fractional uh, contributions and you actually you know can conduct what's being done and reward that. Definitely, yeah. That, that's the whole idea to kind of have incentives alignment um, and just broad alignment of, of the industry. People can, of course, also, um, we have a lot of people that are under pseudonyms, adding value, um, reviewing projects in case they're worried about being judged or anything like I really see this as a community where people come and we, we drop the politics and we just kind of advance the field and uh, yeah, reward people fractionally on, on um, uh, the value they add, the capital, the work, uh, the IP, the everything. So, um, so what kinds of projects do you see uh, Vita Dao as conducting, not just funding, right? I mean, actually organizing and conducting, orchestrating. Yeah, so I mean, um, even even these uh, spin-offs, right? It's it's just kind of maybe not internally because we're an internet first organization. So the people that want to get, actually we have open roles for this. So if people want to run the biotech companies that are being spun out, uh, run the experiments uh, uh, along with the PIs where you as a PI, right? Would let, let me give you a simple example of what I'm trying to say here. Uh, let's, uh, there is longevity Viki, right? There is a big effort where people, where people would write current and, and uh, support current knowledge in longevity. And so I imagine it exists, other people doing that, but if you were running this longevity Viki, you would reward writers with some tokens. That's the kind of uh, thing I'm asking about. Yeah, yeah, totally. And we have another side project, which I haven't yet listed here. It's a decentralized peer review. We call it TLDR, the Longevity Decentralized Review, um, where we use our token to incentivize people to review papers um, pre-publication. And then ultimately, we'll have also a journal called the Longevist um, Journal. And also, again, pay people to, to review papers. And we could, of course, pay people to write articles for for a wiki but we already do that for our blog right we we pay in in vita tokens on and also usd for people to write articles uh to write tweets whatever so yeah that could be a wiki as well but we don't want to duplicate efforts so i i know the the longevity wiki people um yeah if they would want to sort of merge that with us and somehow use our token for um rewarding people to contribute to the wiki actually that's an awesome idea can you describe a bit, okay. um, like the um, the economics of the TLDR and stuff like that? Like, how much do people get rewarded? Or how how big of an incentive is it for people to, you know, like do peer review for longevity stuff? And uh, that's way. sort of to be de determined. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head uh, the exact number of tokens, um, but you can go on uh, on the website. It's um, Longevity that review. 
cool I I thanks share that here yeah longevity that review uh, make an account in uh, write some comments there and if people upvote your your reviews then you'll get more of that i think you get one token per per upvote but you also get some extra i don't know <laughs> all the details it's sort of to be determined you also join our discord join the channel um the specific channel for each project and and add your thoughts and make it whatever you think it should be Again, okay i had one we we will stop here i had one more question but uh it will be if there is time at the end or uh tomorrow or later okay uh now the next uh the next speaker is uh, sorry i have to the, 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 thank you again uh the, the next speaker is uh, <clears throat> Lenden Ace. His research is in uh, uh, stress, healthy aging, and physical exercise at the Stirling University, and also uh, uh, very active uh, in uh, Belgium on, uh, in other uh, university, for example, the F uh, Bray University van Brussel. Okay, Len, you were already opening, uh, so go ahead, uh, perfect. Hello, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me, hear me all right? Yes. That's yes. Great. So, all right. Uh, so, yeah, thank you for the invitation. Um, I will yeah, slightly uh, tell you something about cortisol and the HA ratio in health and longevity and some shor a short um, therapeutic uh, perspectives. So, indeed, I will talk about three things, cortisol and DHA ratio, the cocktail of healthy aging, cortisol, cortisol and DHA health and longevity, and then some uh, therapeutics. And as you will, as uh, Didier already uh, said, I'm a big propose, proponent and PhD researcher about lifestyle uh, or functional medicine. Um, so throughout the presentation, I will drop some really impl implementable uh, lifestyle strategies to, yeah, to improve cortisol and uh, DHA ratio. So first, the cocktail of healthy aging, what is it? So I often describe this ratio in uh, like cortisol, um, a cocktail of healthy aging. So because during aging, endocrine markers increasingly get challenged due to age-related uh, alterations to the uh, HPA axis, the balance of these hormones may be challenged uh, in aging. The first ingredient of the cocktail is cortisol, widely known as a stress hormone, Optimal uh, amounts of cortisol can be life-saving and crucial uh, to reducing, for example, inflammation, but it negatively impacts uh, health when the, the hormone is chronically elevated. When we age, cortisol rises and the rhythmicity of the diurnal output uh, gets challenged because yeah, we actually want sharp rises when we wake up and it should gra uh, gradually uh, decline uh, during the day. And older adults display an increased uh, daily cortisol output, a blunted cortisol awakening response, and a flatter diurnal profile, but I will talk about that later. The second ingredient is DHEA. It's, um, stereo, uh, it's all, also a steroid hormone and gets converted into hormones uh, yeah, such as testosterone and estrogen. DHEA production gradually increases in early life, peaks during the or 20s and then steadily decreases uh, into old age. And by the age of 80, uh, the HEA levels fall by as much as 80 or 90% compared to what they were in uh, young adulthood. So generally, a good ratio lower in cortisol and higher in the HEA is seen in physically active, healthy, resilient, happy people. And with my recently published uh, systematic review, we found that physical activity is likely to improve the cocktail um, by balancing the ingredients towards less cortisol and more DHEA. So as you see, uh, my systematic review, uh, we uh, reviewed intervention and observational studies about physical activity and cortisol and DHEA. Uh, and we found that actually any exercise, as long as the adults, all older adults like it, and maintain it over a longer per period of time that any exercise protocol actually uh, could benefit the, uh, the aging pathway. Also, 
Uh, so actually, some studies found no effects on cortisol, but the general consensus is that an active lifestyle certainly improves the HEA and then counterbalances the negative effects of cortisol. So the HEA displays, in this case, a neuroprotective action. So I will shortly go about cortisol and DHEA in health and longevity. First, let's discuss cortisol shortly. So as I mentioned before, cortisol is absolutely necessary for survival, implicated in immune regulation and stress regulation or stress reactivity. But when it's chronically dysregulated, then it becomes detrimental to health. And it has a circadian rhythmicity, as you see. So uh, when you wake up in the first hour, you have a cortisol awakening response. And in the evening, it should uh, decline gradually. But now when, uh, when it's disrupted, um, you, have, you get yeah, it's chronically disrupted also uh, anyway uh, when you age, but also in chronic disease, depression, uh, and burnout. So you get yeah, all kinds of... Uh, uh, alterations of the cortisol slope. But as uh, we found in our systematic review, that um, physical activity may regulate the cortisol output. Um, and we actually know it already uh, in our own lives, then physical activity, if we did physical activity, then uh, we are less often less stressed. Physical activity may also regulate cortisol and sleep. Uh, in another systematic review, so we, we took a look, uh, we took a look at this, um, and we know also in our own lives that when we are stressed, we can't seem to fall asleep. And also from lab studies, we see that cortisol affects uh, or deep sleep phases. So indeed, cortisol and sleep are interrelated and may both be influenced by physical activity. There seems to be reciprocal interactions between the HPA axis and sleep regulation. One, the HPA axis is implicated in sleep regulation and sleep-wake cycles. So more stress is more sleep. Sleep hygiene and circadian rhythmicity are proven to impact cortisol profiles and stress reactivity. Less sleep, you, know, you notice that you get more stress the next day. So how does physical activity impact stress and cortisol? Well. Physical activity releases all kinds of good hormones and interacts, for example, with interleukins. And there's a mindfulness part also uh, when you're doing some uh, exercise. And why is it good for sleep hygiene? Well, physical activity synchronizes the sleep-wake cycles and also through body clocks, so the main central clocks, but also through uh, muscle clocks and releases hormones such as interleukin-15, uh, which benefits uh, bone mass and sleep. Now about DHEA specifically, DHEA has many effects in both men and women that opposes the deleterious effects of normal aging. Uh, DHEA modulates endothelial function, reduces inflammation, improves insulin sensitivity, we'll come back to that later, improves blood, blood flow, etc. Declining DHEA levels are associated with a greater likelihood of death or disease in observational studies. So implementing, supplementing, it would be a logical approach. However, only weak support for DHEA as a therapeutic compound has been demonstrated. Um, for example, for postmenopausal uh, post women, cardiovascular health, uh, brain health, IVS, and I saw some about uh, autoimmune disorders also with possible adverse health effects. However, it does, it does show interesting benefits to tackle insulin uh, sensitivity, which we'll discuss in the next few slides. And I was uh, looking at it more closely today, and there are interesting mouse studies also that do uh, show promising uh, results, uh, for example, on the immune system and even on the gut microbiome, uh, which ties into the hallmarks of aging. So yeah, maybe there is some future approaches that could benefit uh, aging in humans. It stays around, so I guess uh, there's some benefit to it. All right, so now I'll show, shortly discuss a few uh, therapeutics. Firstly, as I'm a big fan of, uh, there are some uh, behavioral strategies that uh, are important, um, like stress resiliency, uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction, movement and breathing like Tai Chi, yoga, 
uh, social support, physical activity, uh, as we showed in our systematic review, and so on. Uh, now, about DHEA supplementation. For this, I take the TRIM study as an example. They successfully try to regenerate the thymus as they, and as they suggest, the thymus or thymus uh, involution is a major cause of immunosenescent aging cascades. So the involution is a genetically programmed aging process uh, via which the thymus undergoes a prog progressive reduction in size due to loss of uh, thymic epithelial cells and decrease the maturation of T cells, which is important for immune functioning. And they wanted to investigate if using recommend, uh, recombinant human growth hormone prevents signs of immunosenescence in healthy male populations of 50 to 50, uh, 65 years old. And they added uh, DHEA and uh, metformin for the insulin lower, lowering effects. Now, for the TRIMEX study, they plan two arms. Uh, with more participants, males and females, and include minority groups, as you are all aware of. Uh, so again, they will use the DHEA to counterbalance the diabetogenic effects of growth hormone. Um, in a possible not yet existing uh, future TRIM-XX study, they could pay attention to the cortisol DHEA ratio, because we know that chronically elevated cortisol is associated with insulin resistance. So by implementing cortisol regula regulatory strategies, they could attack the diabetogenic effects of growth hormone and also influence inflammation, thus lowering uh, the cortisol DHEA ratio. So to sum, cortisol DHEA ratio does play a role in health and longevity. Aging brings challenges to the balance between these hormones. Higher DHEA and lower cortisol is seen in healthy aging. DHEA is a fountain of youth. But for now, mostly behavioral intervention to improve these levels seem to be widely accepted as a strategy to do so, yeah, improve these levels. The TRIM study used a DHEA supplement uh, for a lot of reasons, but mainly for to increase, increase insulin sensitivity. And don't forget, cortisol, uh, chronically elevated uh, cortisol or better dysregulated cortisol levels drive inflammatory cascades and contribute to insulin resistance, which is a key marking in uh, health and longevity. So as I'm a PhD student, I couldn't have done uh, the research on my own. So uh, my, uh, my acting professor is uh, act uh, Anna Whitaker from the University of Stirling. Thank you. Thank you, Len. Uh, I will ask, uh, I will read the question uh, uh, asked by uh, Edouard, who is, uh, who is following uh, questions around DHAI uh, since a long time. So you write that uh, uh, DHEA is beneficial for healthy aging, but despite many studies, there is not such a clear, clear such a clear thing, sorry, my survival of the studies of DHEA with low and high doses failed to extend life. The TRIM study with the anti-diabetic study is the only quite striking good use. So, yeah, uh, yeah absolutely. I, I do you think in, about saying yeah. it's beneficial is uh, misleading because we do not know any, any attempt of demonstrating a causality failed. Uh, it's a correlation, the HA decreases uh, in life, uh, but that's all. That's all. We have a correlation with time, with age. Um, cortisol, what you explained, is very well known with uh, sleep and, uh, and the, the daily pattern and the, the stress. Uh, for the HA, that in fact even is not, that doesn't exist in mice. Um, um, it is a, a big question mark of whether it really does something. Um, and except making maybe a small hair grow, that's why you may not want to have it in creams, um, in facial creams. 
so there is a big market around DHEA, but uh, it's very doubtful of a big effect on it. And the trim study that used, uses its anti-diabetic uh, uh, thing, yes, uses a, a good aspect of it. Um, so what I want to say is globally, it's difficult to say it's beneficial. And there has been so many studies um, with financial interests trying to show the effect that I just I just feel the need to put a small warning on decipher, yeah. deciphering things. All right. Yeah, absolutely. It's only it, it's only shows uh, indeed correlations or associations, and um, but and and yeah, indeed, I totally agree. And I, I think I express myself wrongly if I say it's, beneficial yes, exactly. because it's an association. But and it strikes me that they continue to do research about the HEA while a lot of yeah, as as you say, it's only association. So, but maybe there is still something in it because they continue to do research about it. But I I don't know. There are patents, there is marketing. But uh, if I may say something, uh, there, there is no patent possible on DHEA itself, no? no. Or... Well, there, the there is a German, there is a German um, company that did something with it and made it like, yeah, they, they got a lot of money out of it. So I, nice. it's something to do. Yeah, should we read it? It's, yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, so if there are other people wanting to ask questions or make comments, it's also possible. Otherwise, uh, uh, so I see, <coughs> yeah, I see a question of <coughs> Philippe van der Nevel, uh, sorry, but it is uh, more a, a question uh, not uh, about what you were saying. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, it's a more general question, Philip. And for this question, it will be more for tomorrow um, uh, because we have a, a general discussion about longevity uh, advocacy. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Len. And now the you, last uh, it is it is uh, for the last speaker, Victor Bjork, who will speak about longevity. Uh, no, he who is member of. Uh, the longevity no deal for deal flow also I did I didn't know about that sorry and uh, scientific uh, advisor at healthy longevity guide and also member of the board of uh, uh, Hills so Victor the floor is yours for something that I am very curious to listen about it circadian uh, uh, aspects are fascinating for me at least. Thank you very much. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen here. Can you all see? Yes. Okay, excellent. Uh, thank you. So I'm going to speak about uh, uh, a paper that I wrote uh, uh, for rejuvenation research a couple of years ago that actually is uh, about uh, the circadian clock and aging, which I consider uh, understudied uh, area, or not necessarily understudied, but uh, underfunded when it comes to translational medicine and the companies. So. So uh, I wrote a paper uh, together with some other HEALS members um, uh, quite a few years ago about uh, uh, classifying biological aging as a disease uh, that got published in the journal Frontier in Genetics. But uh, aging is a very broad concept. So um, my goal here was to, to uh, also introduce the concept of circadian clock aging as a separate disease, something that we would potentially go into WHO and uh, improve the current funding and the goal-oriented research and the biotech business development in the area. So, uh, okay, wait. Yeah, so um, I call it circadian clock neuronal senile atrophy syndrome in the paper, uh, or 
abbreviated Circlonza syndrome. So uh, my goal here was to really be able to explain what it is, not only in an academic manner, but also propose some solutions that we can work on potentially to improve this area. So I'm going to go through here first a bit about circadian clocks and um, aging. So um, circadian clocks are not a new development. They have been around in uh, the tree of life for many hundreds of millions of years. And it's not a conserved gene, but uh, there are many genetics that control it that are different in uh, uh, across uh, the phylogenetic tree of life. And um, it was a Nobel Prize in discovery back in 1984. And uh, it's regulated by many uh, circadian proteins that many of you probably know, like the clock and the reverba and the BMAL and so on. They are very well known. So uh, we all know the famous hallmarks of aging paper. Uh, we know that the, the aging hallmarks also overlap and feedback upon each other and that circadian rhythms become disorganized with the uh, aging. And it could potentially even uh, be called a separate hallmark as they included in the new paper of uh, the hallmarks of health, loss of uh, circadian uh, rhythms could be considered uh, loss of health. So uh, we, we know that elderly people sleep less well. And um, th uh, this is not something that just affects the sleep and the brain, but it affects every cell in the body that has a circadian clock inside them. And uh, it's mainly orchestrated then by the suprachiasmatic nucleus, SCN, in the brain. So. so what is then the, the circadian rhythm really about in the, the suprachiasmatic uh, nucleus? So it's a region in the brain that is above the optic chiasma. So it's controlled by daylight. and uh, it's connected also to the pineal gland, which secretes, secretes melatonin. So it's a very, very small region of the brain. It's barely visible. It's a pair of nuclei with about 9,000 neurons. And uh, it uh, controls then the downstreams all the circadian clocks across the whole body in different uh, tissues. And, uh, so it, the mechanisms of, of the circadian clock is uh, to a large extent known. We know that uh, it, uh, it is uh, disturbed, for example, in the shift uh, workers, but uh, generally it's adapted to our 24 hour rhythm, 12 hour day and 12 hour night, which gets disturbed as well in the polar regions. And uh, so there is this uh, oscillatory amplitude that uh, is very high when you are young, but when you get older, it uh, gets lower and lower, so you can uh, you can uh, clearly see that we, when you measure it on an actinograph, that uh, the expression is very very high high peaks when you're young and low peaks when you get older. So, so yeah. So what happens with aging that mechanistically causes these problems is a depopulation of neurons. Uh, the population of neurons can go down with half about in uh, aged mice. And there's an alteration as well of neurotransmitters that cause a decline in the youthful uh, amplitudes. Um, and then there's also an alteration of electrophysiological properties of the cell, so like a disturbance of ion channels. So the SCN doesn't really stop with aging, but the, it, uh, the output becomes disorganized. Uh, so uh, it's rather that it becomes the like an orchestra that doesn't sync rather than something that universally slows down. And the, the consequences are of course, uh, reduced quality of sleep um, and um, an increased risk of cancer, which we know is uh, very, very elevated in uh, shift workers. When uh, people are getting older, they also get cancer. So it's very hard to elucidate to what extent this is a this would be intrinsically linked to SCN aging, but for certain uh, we know that the, the cell cycle, the timing of the cell cycle is uh, controlled by the circadian clock as well. So of course the cell might get uh, the wrong signals of uh, when to divide and the dividing uh, state having not passed the cell cycle properly because of the misaligned circadian output, which might uh, be an unexplored uh, 
cause of cancer and mediate why shift workers have more cancer, but also why so-called naturally aging people have more cancer. And uh, this accelerates uh, the general aging process across the body, um, of course, and uh, it might even be uh, implied as well in cellular senescence. And you can see here in the young uh, and middle-aged mice that uh, there is like a decline in the, the biological rhythms when we measure that with the actinograph over the day. And mice are, of course, nocturnal, so it's a bit different from humans. So, so let's talk then about some interventions, what we actually can do, because that's what ultimately is relevant for us. Um, it has actually been known for a very long time, uh, already back in 1998, so 25 years ago almost, that uh, one could extend lifespan simply by transplanting neurons to the SCN, to in aged hamsters. So it is quite a significant effect. So they take neonatal tissue from hamsters and transplant it into the SCN of aged hamsters, and you can extend the lifespan that way. So clearly, this you can clock by itself as a single intervention uh, is capable of producing a, a life extension similar to what we see in even a rapamycin. I mean, 9, 14% is generally the benchmark for rapamycin in healthy mice. So, uh, and we didn't know uh, how massive evidence that shift workers live shorter and have an increased risk for cardiovascular disease and cancer. And uh, there have been many longitudinal studies done as well on humans, like from the, um, from uh, early childhood until well into uh, non agenarians so 90 plus people. Uh, and the one has seen that they have a lowered oscillatory amplitude with age. Yeah. So there's uh, many angles of evidence for why it would uh, actually be an important factor. So there are three approaches then to take to the aiding SCN as I can see it. There's a pharmaceutical approach, a med tech approach, and a repair approach, which would be the ultimate cure. So uh, the pharmaceutical approach is obviously already something that is uh, to, uh, to a small degree at least being pursued. Uh, and the goal here there is to develop drugs that increase the circadian output and oscillatory amplitudes. So a bit like a um, amplify the signals, a bit like a hearing aid, just like uh, the hearing goes down with age, you can amplify it so it goes up. But of course, um, in theory at least, when you get extremely old, that wouldn't work anymore because there's so little signals to amplify. So you would uh, end up with sleeping problems and uh, oscillatory disregulation anyway, but you can perhaps compensate it for a while. And we, of course, know that uh, this, the melatonin hormone, uh, it improves sleep and it uh, might be a good addition for many elderly as well to take it. And the uh, NAD boosters con uh, control the circadian clocks as well. So that could be a potential intervention. And there are several lab chemicals, uh, for example, the uh, long day sin and the uh, reverba, uh, which is a central uh, protein that controls the circadian clock. Uh, the reverba agonist, uh, SR9009 and 11, um, and CLK8. And it should be noted also that the SR9009 compounds, uh, they are, are quite used by bodybuilders um, illegally, of course, since it's a lab chemical and not a something that has undergone clinical testing in humans for a particular disease condition. And uh, I am actually not sure why that is the case. And uh, since there's a dysfunction of ion channels that controls calcium influx inside the SCN with aging in the neurons, the, there's potentially a lot of opportunity as well in pharma to improve the function there if you can develop a drug that crosses the blood-brain barrier for that. And there are quite a few academic research groups that are working on, on uh, this. Um, not that, that many, but a few. Uh, and there's a company as well in Oxford called the uh, uh, Circadian Therapeutics. And uh, as far as I know, they, that's the pharmaceutical approach that is currently taken. So I will go into more radical things here in the next slide. And that would be the med tech approach. Uh, you could potentially replace and enhance the SCN with a hormonal uh, pump that would then control uh, all the circadian um, hormones that get disregulated with age. And uh, you could have uh, set up a, like a miniaturized neural drug delivery system that has been actually explored for Parkinson with a carbidopa levidopa pump that you can implant into the brain. Of course, this is a very, very complicated thing with many risks is it will involve neurosurgery and uh, you might not want to do neurosurgery uh, unless there's like a really serious 
cause like a brain tumor or something. Um, but um, this is uh, as well an opportunity to do. And the most um, targeted intervention that would be to go after the root cause, uh, the repair approach. So uh, used induced pluripotent stem cells transplant, and they could be either patient derived or uh, grown in the lab, and or, or potentially rescue the cells. For example, dissolve uh, neuronal lipofuscin that uh, that accumulates with age and might contribute to to the decline in neural function in the SM. So let's see here. And then um, one will need to set up um, the benchmarks of tests to test this intervention. One will uh, be able to anticipate an improvement in uh, uh, REM sleep, the deep sleep that uh, declines with elderly. And actually elderly don't, I mean, they both sleep shorter, but they also have a much lower quality of sleep. And you can see that as well in the reduced oscillatory amplitudes. Yeah. Um, and uh, you would expect a reduction in inflammaging. Um, inflammaging is increased in shift workers as well. Uh, so it, uh, and it increases with age. So um, any normalization of oscillatory rhythms across the body should be regulating this back to more youthful levels. And as well, an increase in mitochondrial count. Um, for example, some drugs that affect uh, uh, the circadian clock also increase mitochondrial biogenesis in the body. Um, and uh, one could potentially uh, also anticipate an increase in physiological function and sarcopenia um, because um, mice that uh, have disturbances in their circadian clock, severe disturbances by uh, dysfunction of the BMAL gene, for example, they, they suffer from frailty and sarcopenia. So it might be a contributing factor as well that is less studied. So this is a really a business opportunity. To my knowledge, there's no company that currently exists that aims to selectively repair the SCM by targeting the specific um, root causes, despite multiple academic uh, um, research group. And I, I cannot, uh, that's something to discuss afterwards what actually the bottlenecks would be, because I am not uh, sure why it's, this is not a bigger topic in that sense. So I, since uh, we are, this is the final talk, I would just like to tell everybody to sleep well as well. Uh, it's getting quite late and with an improved SCN, you could sleep even better. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Victor. Yes, indeed, uh, <laughs> it was a good uh, word at the end, uh, but still we have uh, time for a few uh, questions. Uh, so uh, we have uh, um, we have actually a discussion online about uh, about what you said at the beginning. No, so, so not related to uh, sleep, but related to uh, aging as a disease or not. There are long discussions about it. But okay, maybe you can uh, give a brief comment after reading the 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 dialogue there but i would also ask uh, now if there are people here uh, who have let's say questions about circadian uh, rhythm and uh, aging it will it would be uh, also of course interesting yeah is it possible and if to there, ask yes go ahead yeah, Sorry, yeah, sure, sure. i don't go know ahead. how to raise hands here <laughs> So a uh, great presentation. So what could be done today to prevent uh, aging or, or maybe uh, remove aging uh, of this thing in the heart? Well, um, the thing that one could do uh, are simple interventions like practicing sleep hygiene and giving melatonin for, uh, possible as a sleep uh, normalizer. Uh, and that would work to some extent, but uh, of course, uh, and this is, of course, not something I, I absolutely don't uh, advocate. But in in a theory, one could take the drugs that are currently exist in uh, as uh, uh, lab chemicals that have plenty of uh, mouse data on them, and they do proper clinical trials as well to evaluate them in uh, in uh, humans to to see. So the pharmaceutical approach is certainly there, and uh, there are a few companies working on it. But uh, there's a limited amount of things one can do apart from um, being extra cautious about proper sleep hygiene and perhaps use artificial sun lamps as well um, if one live on northerly latitudes. So that's. Thank you. Yeah. 
Thank you, Daria. Thank you, uh, Victor. Maybe Can I have. I? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you had time already to to read the, and to make a comment. So, so somebody wants to ask uh, a question. Go. I, I want to ask. Uh, uh, thank you, Didier. Thank you, Victor. I want to ask actually, why do you think there is so little work in this direction? Because the connection is so obvious. I mean, uh, sleep is probably the only regenerative medicine that is actually working. Why people aren't investing a lot of um, resources into this particular connection, this particular direction? Yeah, that I mean, that uh, that is a hard question to answer short, uh, give a brief answer to. But uh, um, certainly, I mean, I mean, some areas are simply unexplored. Um, people are not aware. Uh, and there's also the, the indication problem because it's uh, sleeping issues is an annoyance, but it's not a, a direct uh, disease like uh, cancer that uh, that uh, one thinks about, uh, but a more generalized aging problem that is uh, seen as uh, perhaps less of a disease and that's something that needs to change. But then of course the important thing here is to really put the issue on the on the SCN, the, the aging of the SCN as a contributor to that. So, and the advocate for it. Any more questions? Okay, so, um, yeah, can you can you comment about aging as a disease? Uh, just short. Uh, yeah, you know the the old question. So um, Walter is saying, uh, okay. So the old question is: Is this a good uh, thing because everybody is aging and because it's kind of uh, um, people will perceive this as an insult and uh, because uh, we are aging since we uh, are born and so on. Uh, on, or is this uh, still a good thing to say aging as a disease? Or, uh, yeah. Well, uh, I mean, I, I think uh, saying that aging is a disease is a good thing uh, because it uh, would uh, enable people to be more focused uh, on it. But I know it's a very diverse uh, range of uh, opinions there. Uh, but I certainly think that uh, having the, the SCN uh, aging classified as a disease in itself would help. Uh, um, a lot and as well if we if, for example just the, simply the presence of senescent cell in the body was also uh, classified as a disease like call it hypersenocytosis or whatever that makes uh, a particular aging hallmark more uh, amenable for for intervention that will strongly help the cost rather than being too vague about what it is because having too many senescent cells or a dysfunctional SCN that's certainly more concrete and uh, Possible to narrow down than the general feeling. So, uh, thank you, uh, Victor. So, if there are no more questions to Victor, maybe there are questions that uh, you want to ask to the um, to the speakers of uh, the second session. And that you had no time, or maybe you have a general comment, uh, uh, and then uh, we stop here. Um, yeah, just asking if there are no comments is great because we are just uh, uh, at uh, the more or less the precise time we were supposed to stop. And uh, tomorrow we will have uh, uh, at the end of the day again a long day, five hours to speak about uh, more about uh, uh, longevity advocacy, but also to speak about uh, sharing of big data and uh, please be there. So if there is no, uh, no more question, I know stop uh, the uh, recording. Uh,